Is that a fulcrum in the middle or am a I fulcrum? Wrong? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, that's right. Whoa. It's like you're changing a car on a tire. Boop, 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 boop. A car tire with a. Anytime I drink beer, I have better <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Now it's coming out. So, <laughs> the numbers are <laughs> starting to come out. One here. thing about. And we're back. <laughs> Hunter Podcast. Episode 55. Well, this is like the special edition, the the ATO Archery Trade Association show live from the floor, but not really live because Colty's going to produce this thing later. Um, but yeah, we're in person at the ATA show. It feels good to be back in the show. Yeah, it's absolutely an interesting year. It's feeling a little slim. Yeah, man. Yeah. You agree? Yeah, the crowd's down a little bit, but we'll see tomorrow. It's quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. Yeah. That's why we put this podcast together in five minutes. we got some quality people sitting at this we podcast quality right here. Hey, man, you want to do a podcast? Yeah, okay. Listen, but here, now. At, at the end of the day, Jared and I typically are talking to a Zoom screen, um, right. and that's basically it. You know, that's what we have is a yeah, Zoom screen. Usually, you guys are on this screen here, so this is really nice to have people sitting right, sitting yeah, right, right here. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> Don't, don't ever touch me Bond again. The rocket man over here, and <laughs> he's gonna jam me with the spear. Yeah, don't, don't ever touch me again. <laughs> Did you guys the, bring that? Is that a prop? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we brought the we brought the big we brought the prop. Okay, it this does is, have a proper name, which we can get into at some point, yeah, right? right? Yeah, this is just a basic prop for people to basically understand what the heck's going on. Very cool, man. Well, yeah, we are at the ATA show in Louisville, Kentucky, or Louisville, if you want to call it like that, from the it's east. It's Louisville, or yeah. they will. They I go. Will I go you straight. Up. Listen, my wife's a Kentucky girl. I don't want the backhand. It's Louisville. Louisville, Kentucky, um, and we've got some guests with us, right? Yeah. I think so. Troy Fowler? Yes, sir. Welcome to the Hunter Podcast. Yeah. Appreciate Thank you coming in and sitting in with us. Yep. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I'm sure not much introduction needed, but for our listeners, give us a little introduction. Who is Troy? Um, <laughs> I was a person that was never supposed to be involved in the archery industry at all, so... I have a moderately interesting and quite controversial channel called The Ranch Ferry. Mm -hmm. I've heard and, of it. Uh, <coughs> Sounds familiar. A couple familiar. of people have. Yeah. So I have a lot of people here who walk up and talk to me and say, hey, man, nice to meet you. Love your stuff. Just don't tell anybody we spoke. <laughs> right? And they walk off and go talk to cool people. So my whole channel is about um, the highest efficiency killing sticks we can, we can fly through the target, mm -hmm. not to the target. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's basically it in a nutshell. Cool. And I started, um, due to failure, I decided to leverage the pig population on our ranch and start using them for live test material. Mm -hmm. So we have deer feeders. They're moderately predictable. Starting in March, March through September, nobody really hunts on the ranch. Yep. So you can get a lot of shots. They're, they're, they're white tail distance. They're kind of nervous targets, so they move around a lot. Yep. So deer jump the string. So we have that, and I'm elevated. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm just going to go and try everything. Yep. And the biggest challenge with me was I kind of fell in love with killing the big ones. Yep. And it's just like a white-tailed deer. You don't see them, the big bucks, constantly walk by. You say, I'll shoot them tomorrow. Yep. Right? Cameras and all of it. And then when the big ones come out, I was 50%. Wow. Shoot 17 yards, known distance, no tricks, wait till they're cordoned away. Just super tough critters. There was a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I have every expandable, every broadhead. I'm shooting light stuff. There was nowhere else to go. So I read Ed Ashby's study, this is seven years ago, mm -hmm. and said, I'm not doing that right now. Yep. So what the hell do I have to lose? I'm shooting 20 yards. Jump, so right, I, jump right on that mic, Troy. Get, okay. right, get right on it. And I, uh, so I really, I just said, well, if what I'm doing is 50%, what Ed says can't be worse. Right. And I started learning to hand sharpen. So, so what was happening the other 50% of the time? You're just I getting, was getting no half an arrow in them, mm -hmm. and they, were, they would just disappear. Yeah. I do believe to this day that I was having blade erosion issues. Interesting. They're covered with mud. The hairs, yep. are, if you've ever cleaned one, they eat knives. Yep. Right? Yep. And their bone structure is extraordinarily, their their rib cage is 3X. I, I think I can speak for, I don't think Jeremy and I have ever shot a pig. So I've shot one right. with guns. Okay. So this, this right. is new. So they're just please little educate. tanks. Yeah. I mean, the, I know their structure. I mean, there's their shoulder blades and they're, I mean, it's like an armored plate. So the, the easiest thing you could do practically is the next time you get ribs, Pull a piece of the meat out that you eat, mm -hmm. 
and it's never wider than your thumb. Not right. much. Right. So just, just okay, let's call compact. that three quarters of an inch. Yep. You're going to hit bones. Yep. I think the blade, the broadheads I was shooting were deteriorating to the point that they would not cause trauma internally. I'm also a respiratory therapist. I had cadavers in school, and I've studied how to keep you alive with a hole in your body. I understand what it takes to make you die with a hole in your body. Mm -hmm. It's all reverse engineering. Tell us how to beat COVID, too. Yeah, right. (laughs) So, (laughs) speaking of COVID, (laughs) so. And it's arrived. Right. So, I just started playing with better quality broadheads, higher, better tuning of the arrows themselves. Mm -hmm. And I started just. When I did it right, they didn't make it. I'm talking 50 yards. I expect nothing to go 50 yards anymore when I hit them right. Crazy, man. Nothing. And it's a dramatic difference from seven years ago. And it's still the same shots. So I just started shooting, shoot quarter two, shoot quarter away, try to break things. Mm -hmm. And then I met that guy. And that would be Daryl Barnett, the Rocket Man. Is that and, is that a true nickname, oh like yes. an Elton John? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah, sure. love that man. Mm-hmm. That's his, right, he's, mm-hmm. he'll tell you they technically never worked on a rocket. Mm, whatever, he shot stuff that went Mach eleven or something. Boring yeah, that's like that. fa- I gotcha. That's pretty fast, right? So we call. So him if man. we say, well, this obviously isn't rocket science, that's we right. actually are full of shit because it kind of is. is a, there's a lot of it, and interesting. When I first met Daryl Barnett, he's much more. I like saying it this way because it's more fun. But he said, hey, Troy, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> I like it that way. He Darryl, didn't say it that way. He's a straight shooter. So <clears throat> kind of introduce yourself a little bit there, Mr. Barnett. And Yeah, thanks, Troy. Uh, so I grew up shooting guns, uh, shooting bows, just an average. Just, yeah, you guys can feel free to grab those mic wherever you yeah. want to okay, get it on your face, sir. Where are you from? I'm yeah. from uh, East Texas, Texas, Canada. Texas originally, just on the border of Texas and Arkansas. Mm-hmm. South, and, though, so you considered a Texas man. Yes, absolutely. We were born on on the Texas side absolutely. of the state line. From, yeah, 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 a Texas. mile away from the border. Yeah, right, <laughs> of Texas. Texas says every, Texas every can be. State. Yeah, yes, I got that's it. Right. <laughs> a mile in. Yeah, and uh, we grew up hunting and fishing and doing all those kinds of things. Uh, I started flying model airplanes when I was a kid. Just happened to fall into that. Uh, went down that road and decided. Hey, I really like this. I'd like to learn more about it and how to uh, understand how airplanes fly and all of that. So I went off to school at the University of Texas, got a degree in aerospace engineering, stayed, got another degree in aerospace engineering. And then the government came along and I started working for the Department of Defense designing projectiles. That's an important place. Yeah, designing projectiles for uh, electromagnetic rail guns. And uh, that was a long and storied career. And they finally said, okay, we've had enough of you. Mm -hmm. There's the door. We're done with electromagnetic rail guns. Thanks for, thanks for your time. Good people land on their feet. We'll see you later. And uh, that was, uh, that was a 20, 25 year career. Wow. Doing that. And uh, so then I got involved with, uh, well, I got involved with some technology that I thought, hey, that's really great technology. Let's transfer that over to the sporting goods arena because there's a lot of things that the DOD does that, that are useful in the industry, but nobody knows about. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I think I can bring that in. I think I can talk about that. I started watching Troy online, and uh, it turns out we live in the same city, Austin, Texas. Small world. Yeah, and uh, so we, through a fortunate series of events, uh, hooked up, and we've done a lot of testing together. You'll see some of that on Saturday, and uh, just enjoying the ride. Isn't that funny? I mean, how, you know, obviously your background and your background, yet it comes back to a passion, which is, is hunting right right, right like right. that that's really and it and i think it's just because it's one of those things that's so rooted at the heart of what we do you know in our everyday lives you know that's one of the reasons when i started our media business and jared and i started hunter was like well i just love doing this all the time why can't i make this my job all right you right. know like it, it you know you see you hear so many people talk about oh man i like i hate to work but i love to hunt and i'm like well you know, why, why do you do 80% of your time at work, which you hate and only 20% of your time, you know, doing what you love, right. like figure out how to f- flip that around. And we've been fortunate that we have that our place in South Texas that we can do whatever, Tannerite, canned yes. guns, whatever you want to do. And then we also have another test lab in Austin where we can go out and we've done high speed video and we've started really exploring the stick. Yep. What happens when the stick lives, leaves the string? And he's going to have some videos tomorrow where we put progressively more aggressive fletchings on. And once you get above a certain degree, which is eight or nine degrees, 
the back of the arrow actually so going like that. So I guess Daryl, maybe <laughs> maybe I never expected that. I expected better. I expected it to overwhelm the stick and shoot straight. Yeah. So, so say again, that happens when you do what? So when you really put a very aggressive helical on the shaft, yep. like yep. fifteen degrees. Yeah. Like we're talking stupid. They look like yep. they're sideways. Sideways. Yep. The arrow takes off, and actually starts rotating, rotating the, the back. pass into the arrow goes like that. Okay. Like fish tailing. Because it's out of out of sequence with the rolling of the shaft itself yep. and the way it's bending. Okay. There's a whole lot of aerospace man and he's still teaching me. Well, I so sound smart. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. That's what about. I was gonna say, Daryl. So it, let's let's break it down as simple <laughs> as can be, okay? Because most of our listeners are bow hunters, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Most sure. of our listeners are bow hunters. <clears throat> We're all bow hunters. If we think about the 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 process of the the arrow and the shot when it's really really soon, what are the factors there that as a bow hunter we need to consider in order to do what you did, which is make efficient kill shots every time, right? right. What are those factors? Because we we talked about it briefly before we got on this podcast, and I said, man, when I got out of the double X seventy five era and carbon came out, it was like lighter is better, lighter is better, lighter fast. And then all of a sudden it was like, man, I never get a pass through. Right. You know, and right. so, and I don't think that, um, you know, we, we catch shit, Frank, all the time. I said it something during our uh, Shane Simpson blood trailing one where I said, I think a lot of crossbow guys are shooting these 500 feet per second crossbows with a super light arrow and a hundred grain broadhead. And they're wondering why they're not getting a penetration. And it's like, well, yeah, there's your arrows not built correctly. So there's all kind of stuff going on there. So, so I guess walk <laughs> us through walk us through some of the basics here, right? Well, and, of of and, what it leaves. And what's the, the main thing you guys are trying to like address? Like, what's the main issue that you're seeing here? And so, like, give us a sneak preview on what you're going to okay. try to educate. Right, on yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the goal is. The goal is the air, the stick is always on the other side in the dirt. Okay, perfect. It should never be in the animal. Perfect. There will you should the highest percentage of shots you take should end up in the dirt. And everybody wants Agreed. that, right? From a tracking, no, from a, they don't. You are wrong. Really. Nope. There are some pros oh, yeah. here who think that the shaft inside the animal is optimal. <laughs> Carnage. <laughs> That's what they want, right? right? They want it stuck in there. and They think it's moving around. Yeah. That seems crazy. Mm. That is so crazy. we'll back up to him because... I want to pass through. You do, but maybe you're smart. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> I don't know. So the goal is to have... Okay. Outside of bad shot placement from shooting poorly or the jump right. the string yep. or you hit a stick or make marginal mistakes, shots, things you can't control. Correct. We want to narrow the variables down to love it. Dirt. Now we're talking science. Bloody shaft in the dirt. All right, Daryl. Yeah, sure. What do we need to do to do that? Okay, so one of the things that I've found Creep over up. one of the things I found after looking. Uh, just watching YouTube videos of, of people talking about arrows and arrow flight and what's happening is there's a lot of misinformation out there about. You don't say. Oh my, it, it sure is. <laughs> I've never and, heard oh any. My. Yeah, it's, it really surprises me coming from uh, industry where forums and uh, technical papers are written that you go to the oldest sport of launching some projectile against an animal, 10,000 years, and you have no technical repository of data or information. It's, everything's anecdotal. Everything's, well, he did that, so I'm going to do that, or that's what my shop said. And I'm like, this is crazy. We need to change that. We need to change the industry. Get rid of the misinformation. Let's learn uh, to start with how arrows fly. The next step will be how they penetrate. How do you get the best penetration performance? But before you get to the penetration, you got to learn how to get your arrow down there. Yes. And that's kind of things that I'm talking about tomorrow. I can't cover a lot. But uh, like, for instance, I'll give you a perfect, for instance, of, of information that the bow hunter needs, but it's not there. And that is the drag of a broadhead uh, versus the drag of a field point mm -hmm. on the same arrow. Mm -hmm. You can have 50% more drag from a, from a broadhead that's actually being shown here at this show. You can put that broad, you can replace the field point, and at 60 yards, you'll get nearly a, a three and a half inch drop. Wow. And you're like, okay, well, no big deal. Three and a half inches, that's no, that's no big deal. So if you're trying to shoot 60 inches and you've got a three and a half inch drop, that means if that animal takes a step back, that three and a half inch drops becomes over a four inch drop and you'll miss the animal. You'll be outside the target zone, assuming the target zone is an eight inch circle, hmm. right? So your field point will hit in the center of that circle, but your broadhead will hit outside that circle. 
And I'm like, there is no app. None of the apps out there cover the fact that the, the drag of the broadhead increases. You can't just take your field point off and put your broadhead on there and assume it's going to hit at the same point. Yet people talk about doing that all the time. Well, and I think that assumption is usually, you know, in regards to expandables, right? If I take my field point out and I put on a tight expandable, then it shoots the same. Yeah, that's not true. Incorrect. That's incorrect, right? It might shoot the same to 30 yards. It might shoot the same to 40 yards. But there's a, there's a, a parabolic decay in the, uh, in the uh, drop, mm -hmm. okay, or increase in the drop. So let's say at 40 yards, you hit a tenth of an inch off yep. of your field point. At 60 yards, that could be four inches. At 80 yards, that could be 11 inches, wow. right? So there's a huge increase in the drop just due to the drag on the arrow. And we've been studying that with the Labradar. Mm -hmm. which is a gizmo that's yep. 12 by 12. Yep, I know that, yep. Right, and we've been doing the drag coefficients of different broadheads and shooting them down range and saying, wow, it's just a fact. We, It's known. It's not the same projectile. Yeah. Right. It's, it's yeah, we know bigger it's and less it's, aerodynamically it, it's, efficient. It's laziness, right? Right. So you got to shoot. Basically, what he's saying, very simply, is if you're going to shoot far, you got to shoot broadheads. You should practice with your broadheads. You head. should not. You should have a practice set of broadheads. Mm -hmm. Right. Or you just you're just living in a in a fantasy world. Interesting. You're not really I've always thought I've always had issues like growing up and going from you know different broadheads and arrows and bows that I'm always like, man, <clears throat> when it comes time to actually shoot this animal, like I can't believe more people aren't having like just just issues because they don't fly the same as I've been shooting all summer. Whether it's because of the the clothes that I'm wearing or because I've got a new broadhead and a lighted knock yeah, on there. Right. Like I've always noticed that it was it's kinda off and I'm like I I know there's guys that have tried to address that. I know like G5 came out with the broadhead, that, as does you know Rage and several others that are like, hey, this just shoots exactly the same as your, uh, you know, your field point. And they're trying to address that issue that I think you're talking about. No, right? honestly, they're trying to address trying. it, but it's yeah. the drag coefficient is still there. It's still inefficient compared to the the bullet shape, perfectly sure. aerodynamic, well, pretty aerodynamic point. And this is a lot of the stuff that I've learned from him, <clears throat> and been pretty amazed on. And then when we started doing the downrange energy stuff, which is what I'm going to talk about tomorrow at 4.30, um, that was mind-boggling. So I got tired of the elk guys. Mm -hmm. I got exhausted with people saying, I want to be able to shoot 60. I understand your arrow system. The idea you have is probably better for big stuff. Mm -hmm. Got that. Okay. But I want to shoot 60. And then we did the energy graphs and the energy dump. The 388 grain arrow out of the fastest bow I own, okay, was running 295, I think, somewhere in there. And it launched at about 74 foot-pounds of kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. It hit at 52 at 60 yards. Wow. Now, all you need to do is go on this thing called the Internet, which apparently is going to be around for a while. It is. And look up kinetic energy values for expandable broadheads of the guys. They have more data the yeah. fixed blade guys aren't printing it because they're pretty efficient. Yep. And you're seeing numbers of 35, 45, 55 foot-pounds that they're printing in their literature as an opening value for the broadhead. So if you're hitting at sub 52, that. At, if you're hitting 52 foot-pounds of kinetic energy at 60 yards, which it's just math, you can't argue with math. Yeah, it's not going to open. That's why their penetration dump. It has no extra wow. go if those numbers are correct. When we push them through a raw hide, we're getting values of 100 foot-pounds hmm. holding up an axis to your skin. Yep. And then you take a razor-sharp two-blade fixed blade, push it by the knock and go like that, and it just shoots through the skin like nothing. So it's become less of a war for me. I kind of have a reputation for calling them flappers and making fun of mechanical broadheads. That's fine. I don't, I'll always have that moniker. Fine. <laughs> but then... It, when you, yeah, right. That's what I call them. So, but then when you start doing the math, which is just the last year, it just doesn't start making sense. And then what you see on video starts making a lot of sense. Yeah, what you're seeing from the actual so results. So if you're shooting 20 yards, yep. your, your bow launches at 75 or 80 foot-pounds. Mm -hmm. Gets to 20. It's at 60. Still opens. 45 is wasted on opening. You have 15 to keep going. It's crazy. We should do it the other way around. We should have a 10-pound broadhead yeah. on the front with 50 pounds of kinetic energy to still keep going. Yep. Because you don't know what you're going to hit. Yep. And I've become more passionate about it because of this clown over here, the rocket man. I love it. And doing the science. 
It's like just numbers. Said, like I said, he said, you know what you're doing, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now I do. And it, the numbers are terrifying. So what, I mean, we talk about broadheads here. I mean, are there other aspects of the arrow that are more critical, equal critical, or is the broadhead the most critical piece of that launch? I think that the arrow flight's more critical and then a decent Agreed. broadhead on the front. So, so, sharp, so, so accuracy? So sharp aside. Okay. Sharp aside. No, yep. I, consistency is a different thing. Consistency. So I think I might be the only YouTube channel on the planet who offers a solution to bear shaft spend some time to get every arrow going the same way so <clears throat> pick up jake's arrow jake's arrow carbon arrows have a seam mm -hmm. this is known people talk about the stiff side da, da, da. there's some there's some uh, vendors here who offer spine aligned so they put them in a ram and the spine align them yep so that the spines all the same it's so the stiff side and then it progressively changes so think about it in quarter pieces it's easier Stiff up, next softest, theoretically the softest, and then this one should match bend the other way. Yep. So as the seam goes around the, the arrow, it'll go this way, it'll go that way, mm -hmm. it'll go that way, it'll go that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't bear shaft knock tune them, then every arrow you shoot is either gonna go that way or that way or that way or that way with a wing on the front. Yep. And this guy always says, once it leaves the string, it's over. Your fate is doomed. There, what doesn't get better is basically the message. Yeah, basically what we're saying is you want that. You, the arrow is going to bend. It's being pushed. We know it's going to bend. We, we know, know it's going to bend. bend. Yep. What you want is it to bend in the same direction every, every time. time. Every time. Consistent. Mm -hmm. Up, right, left, down. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you if you can get them all bend the same, so, then they all shoot the same. So how am I bear, how am I bear shaft tuning? What, what's the technique there? So you just... Cut the fletchings off whatever you're shooting. Okay. Put up some paper. I Seven yards is adequate. Seven. Doesn't mm -hmm. need to be much more than that. Beyond that, it really becomes you. Yep. So 20-yard bear shaft can be done, but you better be damn good, right? Yeah. And the wind and stuff can mess with you. So cut the just take one shaft, cut the fletchings off, and shoot it through a piece of paper and see what happens. If it tears four inches left, then your fletchings are masking that launch. Interesting. Okay. That being said... The fletchings may correct for it and make you think it's fine, but you've got a wing on the front. Gotcha. It bites into the atmosphere, takes off this way, the fletchings correct, and then it goes that way, and it's rotating. So it's doing loops. And it's not doing the same loop. So if they all launch the same, they may take off like that, and then they'll stabilize and be okay to a certain extent. Don't light me up there, Barnett. No, you're fine. <laughs> can you, can you're you, doing great. Can he's you like, he's that? over there like, eh. Can you see no, that no, with good. the naked <laughs> eye, though? Like, because, you know, I know personally, like, if I'm shooting arrows, like, every once in a while you'll get one, and you're like, ah, oh, no, that one was screwy. Singer. But, but uh, there's a lot of them that I'm like, no, those all seem to fly the same. Can I see that? No, typically we don't. Typically now we're shooting, every time we shoot, we run a 120 frames per second camera. At least off the shoulder okay. to see what's happening. So I can't, I can't process that fast. Well, you, there's two aspects of this. One is you can't. I say this all the time. I'm going to say it here too. That shooting the bow is very visceral. You shoot a light uh, arrow mm -hmm. out of a high poundage bow, it's going to go extremely fast. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that's really cool. That is very lethal, right? But the fact is, that's near the bow. And you don't have any idea of what it's like when it gets near the top. I just know where it landed when yeah. I get up there. You know where it landed when you get up there, but you don't know what uh, what are the physics of it. If, is it bending when it gets up there? Chances are, if it's a lightweight arrow, low spine arrow, it probably is bending, and it's still bending after it hits the target and after the penetration is stopped. Yeah, that's that another thing. Is still bending at impact. They turn into bananas. And does that mean, like, if even if I hit, let's say, directly behind the shoulder where I want, if it hits bending, can it come out sure. back? It can redirect, yeah. So, do y'all tune? Do, what do y'all do for tuning? I mean, we just shoot bear, shoot fletch through paper, or what do y'all? I mean, what do y'all do? Shoot fletch through paper usually. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I won't say that I bear tune. I shoot fletch through paper. I'm watching to see which apparently it's going to counterbalance. So I probably shouldn't see any tear, right? Sort of. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, at some point it corrects itself. Mm -hmm. So no, obviously, like if my my rest or something's off, like I can tell tear left, low left, yeah, you know, yeah, high right, whatever. So um, here's another thing that the rocket man taught me, and we'll get. I love the the arrow really helps. Yeah, I love the arrow. Okay, so 
Not that anyone. Are these for sale? Yeah, right. <laughs> if you want. This is your actual arrow, right? This is the one you shoot. This is the one I shoot. Oh shit! I got to make some adjustments. Yeah, right. I have a rest this wide. So, not that anyone here has ever drifted in a ditch. Uh, I did but last I night. I have. I did last uh, night. Uh, yeah, right. I buried this Perfect. son of a bitch. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So, when wasn't my fault. You have a car. But. Compared to a bow, you have an unlimited power supply to get you back corrected into the road. Yes. So let's say you're having a great time, and you drift into the ditch on the right-hand side. This is side. a great story, Trey. I right? just lived this. Go over the top. You punch the gas. Mm-hmm. You drift exactly the same amount into the other ditch, and then you correct and go down the middle. Yes. Because you have brakes and gas and some control, and you're just screwing around, and you're not doing anything dumb, and you, it, you intended to drift. Mm-hmm. Okay? You're just screwing around. Sometimes you take out a mailbox. It's mailbox, okay. Mailbox, whatever. Deer, mm-hmm. fence, whatever. Yeah, it right? happens. Your buddy, it's your buddy's truck, of course. You don't do they, yours because you scratch it up. It's a company vehicle. Right. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's even better. <laughs> They don't, company cars never die. I had plenty. Yeah, they, they never they die. They don't die. They'll be all right. The problem with your arrow is it is slowing down at launch. The minute it leaves the string, it is not ever going to go faster. If it drifts into the ditch on the right-hand side, and this is your shot line, mm-hmm. it loses speed, never overcorrects equivalently to the other side to ever go down the middle again. Hmm. So it goes out here. It's less over here. It continues to go out here, goes back, maybe back to the shot line, and takes off to the right in this instance, and then stabilizes, and you think, okay, well, I just need to move my rest. No. It's bending like a banana. This is a 400-spine arrow with a 70-pound draw, right? The fast, fast stuff. Yep. It never can overcorrect to get back to the shot line. Gotcha. So if you had pins that were at an angle, hey, who cares? Shoot it over there. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Except it's a banana on impact. Yeah. So there's just so many things. So, and is that spine alignment that we're trying to like address with that conversation? And so by bear shaft spine aligning, you're hoping to correct that. I don't or at least think get consistency out of it. Get consistency out of it. Okay. So not correct it. So there's a technical term for this, and I'll go ahead and say it yeah, for the viewers us. if they want to look it up. Aerodynamic yeah. jump. Aerodynamic <laughs> jump. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. We get that. Okay. Yeah. It's not. And, the, and what is that? It's not the new dance craze. Okay. Could be uh, for engineers. <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> right, was, Good one, Daryl. Uh, <laughs> No, it's uh, it's an actual fact where the where the arrow is called swerves. It swerves off the bow in the direction that the head is pointed, and it moves. It has uh, inertia when it moves in that direction, right? Mm-hmm. And it never comes back on the shot line. And the, it's called the aerodynamic jump angle, is the direction that it heads off into. Mm-hmm. That's not the direction that the target's in. It's in the direction that it ultimately swerves back to. And so you're saying it's spine alignment and also like a large wing like. You know, double bladed, fixed blade broadhead is influencing that even greater. Uh, any broadhead on the front, anything up up front that has a wing on it, even mechanicals, uh, every arrow. But that would that be on a plane, though, right? Blade. Like this is going to influence it more obviously mm-hmm. than a, a small, yeah, of course, mechanical yeah, broadhead. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So but I'll they get, all I'll get to how to how to tune for that. You okay. Can tune for that. But uh, if you don't control the direction that that arrow bends to make it consistent every time, mm-hmm. it's going to jump in a different direction every time, and it's going to cause greater dispersion. So you could have one go off sure. the shot line right, then drift in the ditch left first, and then try to come back, and they're going like this all down range. So back to the original question is, what's more important? We need something sharp up front that doesn't explode. Yep. Structural integrity, yep. Ed Ashby, exactly. number one. Agreed. Okay, that's pretty agreeable. We mm-hmm. don't want our broadheads coming apart or dulling. Mm-hmm. Easy. Yep. But... If the arrows are completely inconsistent and one goes left, one goes right, one goes up, then you have this broadhead tuning nightmare and it just, it's flabbergasting. So then it opens up the miss. So we'll call a eight inch circle a white tail kill zone that's 12 ring, right? Mm-hmm. You hit them there, mm-hmm. right in the vital V, done. Mm-hmm. Well, that arrow should have been right on the crease and because of your arrow flight, it was two inches back and you thought you did okay. You don't even know that the aerodynamic system threw the arrow to the right. You said, I have a dead deer. And I aimed at that, and it hit it right where, kind of where I was aiming. Mm-hmm. But it's not. The flight pattern isn't right. as true as you believe it is. Correct. And that's the thing that's, in the last year, just, I mean, I've had my head spun off by this guy. And then when you back it up with the math, it's, it's, it's a hard war to fight. It, it, you, you just can't. You're going to die on the hill. So Matt's going to beat you every time. (laughs) Can I ask a a stupid question? This will take me back a little bit just because I'm completely naive to this. I I was actually really good at science except for physics. I was freaking terrible at that. Yeah, right. Hey, Mom. Yeah. 
Uh, I didn't say the F word though. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you did. Uh, <clears throat> so when I was younger, right? Let's you know go back twenty plus years. I remember like my dad and I were shooting bows and we a slow bows, right? And yeah, sure. You know, he, maybe he was shooting double X seventy fives. I was mm -hmm. shooting like whatever. I could always remember, and I you know part of it was probably inconsistency. But as I went like back in distance, right? Twenty was twenty. You're on true. Now, if I'm looking at a, I'm talking about a multi pin sight, right? Right. All of those pins should be left and right in line, right? And theoretically. Just, mm -hmm. You know, theoretically and go down, right? I can vividly remember both myself and my dad. I would look at our sites and I'm like, this one's in, this one's, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's in, and it's as you back up, right? It's not yeah, every right. shot. Like right. 20 was 20 and then it was like, this one's it. I Is it because like what we're talking about here and that yep. that's throwing it off essentially? But you don't so, see sites anymore that have that adjustability. So like, yeah, I have the same thing. Cause like I'm I just backed up to thirty and said the pin goes there. I don't care. Do you, yeah. And well, it's do you like, think they even had that in. adjustability on purpose back then, or that's just how they built the pins? I think that's just how they built them. It and then, that, then it had, there was user you know error. What I'm involved. About, yeah, right? I remember my dad's was the same way. I was like, why is the one? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Like I'm not in Daryl's class of education here, but I can I know that. So, so twenty five <laughs> yards. I know so twenty five yards. You kind of Kentucky winded you in between. Well, uh, yeah. So it yeah. would be yeah. So you would have he took the average of the pins. Yeah, thirty would be like maybe just a couple hairs in right and yeah. then like 40 was a little uh, you weren't remember. shooting past 30 yards back then. no you aren't but uh, in theory is yeah. what i'm saying yeah, yeah. but yeah you, they wouldn't and like obviously like i shoot a single pen and it's like no matter where it is like it's right. straight slides straight, straight, straight. true right yep. so but that's you know and of course back then i don't you know who knows why so that means that the arrow was swimming going down range as we were yeah so that means and it's rolling and, and rolling, rolling. It okay so that at impact if you have the pins Chainsawed? Yeah. You should be terrified what's going to happen at impact because that means the arrow's well, you swimming know, like this. And I feel a little bit bad because I'm sure I eventually gave my dad shit and I was like, man, you just can't hold worth a damn. Like, it's right, just you're right. inconsistent. But Absolutely. it's actually the arrow flight, the performance of the arrow. Yeah, that's itself. why I said I've, I went from kind of broadhead focus, more higher mass. The higher four to center arrows are more stable, generally speaking, but you have to still have to go through the process. So, aerodynamically, mathematically, a higher forward to center arrow is a more stable projectile. And remember, Ed says this all the time. They're always flying. Yep. In the air. And they're flying in meat. Mm -hmm. So if they are not stable on impact, they're not stable on impact. And then they can't fly through meat. Back to your point is, if it hits a little wonky, it could redirect. Yep. I just saw a video somebody sent me of some guy shooting a pig that was about 100 pounds, some little... You know, zoomer running around, and it went hit the hit the pig. You see the expandable hole, and the arrow, the pig turned towards the camera, and the arrow went behind it. It went, it literally just took a made a U turn. And isn't it really? It's it's the loss of momentum when that happens. That's the real concern, not necessarily the the redirection. Correct. Even though that is concerning, it's the fact that you're losing all of the momentum that's going to carry it through the animal. So you're losing the momentum that you have when it hits, and then starts to redirect. It redirects at impact. Mm. But it that's, doesn't redirect that's halfway through. flight path, right? I mean, right. the redirect is not coming from momentum loss. It's coming from flight path. Right, right. but then it sucks all the momentum out, right? Yeah. Well, it's like if you hit something sideways. sideways versus, you know, right. straight through it. Yeah. Just, this is obviously going to carry through. We've Makes all sense. missed hit a nail. It's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It's from the back, but it's the same basic concept. You got okay. a straight nail, you hit it, it goes sideways. So, I mean, because the big thing that I think, if, if there is an educated market on this currently in, in the bow hunting sector, especially, it's, you know, everybody talks FOC, FOC, right? And that's probably the, Which, that's the calculations I, we've done, right, I, is FOC. Are, are you guys like, you know, I'm sure you've seen that like in the past, what's it been, two, three years now mm -hmm. that, like for, for me, it was that uh, those East of Full Metal Jackets, Granted, I'm I'm younger than you guys are, so I know that you could be my child. Back man. in the day, I'm 20, 28. I know I'm fifty three. I have a twenty six year old. <laughs> my dad's fifty four. So listen, all that to, to say, I know that back in the day, that guys used to shoot heavy arrows all the time and big fixed blade broadheads, and that was right. the thing. Yeah, the Eastern Full Metal before, Jackets were that before kind of before the speed became like what what guys wanted. But then, just more recently, here it was that Eastern Full Metal Jacket that started to get guys to consider heavier setups again. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, anyways, that was the mm -hmm. first time that I was like, oh, like, why would you shoot a really heavy arrow? And then we start hearing about, like, the grizzly sticks and, and, you know, and ranch fairy we came across. And so I'm, you know, we're aware of, like, a leaning back in that uh, direction. Is that something that you guys are, like, stoked to see in the industry? I mean, do you think that's going in the right direction? I think it's good for our business because we're going to start shooting arrows under the dirt. Yeah. And people are going to not track anymore. My goal is never to blood trail. 
I yeah. like shoot that. and you hear foomp. Yeah, I love that. I don't want to. I don't like blood trailing. I so, don't want well, to be good at so it. So here, here's where I stand on it. I 100% agree with everything you've said up until this point. Mm-hmm. When we first started, you know, exploring that, we're like, what is this FOC? We came across some guys that were like, uh, you know, unless you're shooting a, a fixed blade broadhead and you're shooting a 650 grain arrow, like you're doing it wrong. No. You know, and, and I kind of got a weird taste of like, well, okay, I understand penetration and that's absolutely important, yep. you know, but I'm shooting primarily whitetails and, and frankly, yes, I want to pass through, uh, but at, at what point are you sacrificing like a cutting surface for overkill momentum? You know, so, so that, that would be my argument yeah, towards right. no, I got, I get this a, a mechanical. Lot. Yeah, it's okay. fine. So <laughs> it's the fine, first it's thing, fine. yeah, it's, it's okay. I get this all the time. Yeah, you suck, but it's okay. <laughs> so <laughs> one thing I got to start preaching, and I'm going to do it here, is I haven't ever, 650 is unbelievable. Yeah. On meat, 700 well, what, what are we, Jeremy? I'm, I'm 470. Right. You're so, probably 430 ish. 4, 435. I'm shooting an 80 pound setup, he's shooting 70. Right. So, yep. We just had. A lady shoot 60 pounds and spot and stalk a Cape Buffalo. We had a lady shoot a Cape Buffalo with a 44-pound recurve with an 800-grain arrow and shot through it. Wow. And we had a lady kill a Cape Buffalo with 50 pounds and 750 no. grains and shoot through it. And obviously, you know, maybe I'm stating the obvious, like, they're sacrificing distance of course. for that setup, right? Right. Which, is it, and I, I mean, again, to your point, Jared. How so? What do you mean? Well, the he- if it's a big, heavy arrow like that on a 44-pound recurve, she's yep. not shooting yeah, 50 yards. She had, to, she had to limit her shots, right? I had this discussion with There's Eric Snyder. There's a sick feeling, though. Uh, and, and listen, I don't mind. I'm not going to call it the name, but I, we talked about it on a podcast recently. These guys shooting 118 yards at, at animals with I a bow. I don't think that's... You know, because they think that they can. Okay. And I get it that there's, a, there's an accuracy point. Yeah, these are, there, these right? are outliers. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Well, no, no, but I mean, how many guys... Uh, no, no. The way that the bow manufacturing has gone has put a false confidence into anybody that goes and picks up a new no, bow I that they could that. shoot no. 60, 60, 70 yards. Far. Sure. Yeah. I it's mean, I, most of the deer I've killed has been under 30. Well, that's, that's what primarily. It that's what so it I'll address your question. Yeah, please. So, um, it, and you understand what I'm saying. Everything right? works when you hit them right. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And I don't plan for right. Yep. So that's why I won't. I just don't shoot anything under 600 anymore because I'm used to it. Okay. I, it's normal to me now. Okay. I'm shooting 50 yards right now with 730 grains because I'm going nail guy hunting next week yep. or next month. And nail guy are six or seven hundred pounds and make an elk look like a cream puff, you know. So, but I've always said try to get your four to center to sixteen percent. Okay. And try to get to five fifty, but it's got to fly. Yeah. So if five hundred, it's got to fly. It's got to fly bear shaft. Okay. So if five hundred flies bear shaft and five fifty does doesn't go back go to five hundred, don't shoot a crappy arrow because gotcha. you're trying to ranch very heavy the thing, right? Okay. But what, what about speed, Troy? What do you, what do you look at as far as it's obviously got to fly? Don't. You I don't do not care about speed. The kinetic energy values are so high with what I'm You shooting. don't care about speed. It doesn't matter. And it anymore. does, again, it limits you to a distance. 50 yards? 50 yards and <laughs> a so, wow. so would you say the same for like a Western? So, if, you know, if you're going on a hunt where it's very likely you could have a 60 or 70 yard shot at an, an elk, let's say. So, right. Uh, I'm old, so bear with me. This is this is fun with all you guys who have wound up on your testosterone at a young age. No, that's just his pre-workout. Right, I got that. It's his pre-workout. I'm just messing with you, man. No, but seriously, I talked to Aaron Snyder about this, and he said, "So you're telling me if you go out west and you go elk hunting, you're going to shoot a 650 or 700 grain arrow?" And I said, "Yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to shoot 40. I'm I'm going to. There's a lot of he and I said, Aaron, stop before you." try to keep going here and he's hard got to stop mm-hmm. i said you shoot a stick bow your point on is 32 you just told me that and you shoot 580 grains how far do you ever shoot and he went kind of got me yeah right you got me yeah he because of the stick bow has to be disciplined enough sure. to shoot 40 mm-hmm. so what i'm going to plan for is when they step on you yep. and i'll I mean, that's why I, we, I'm that's not why we very politically anyways. correct. So I saw a video of John Dudley shoot an elk at like 10 yards. Yeah. And the arrow almost fell out at impact. <laughs> the man is 6'5". He's got more velocity than anybody in here. Yep. Yeah. And the arrow went in about seven inches on yep. this big bull. And I just want to text him and say, bro, I can fix that. 
Yeah. It was right there. It walked out of the bushes right in front of him, and the arrow just stopped. Right? Yeah, and I think that's, that's the shot I'm going to plan for. Well, and that's what I guess I'll I'm, just give up 60. Well, well, but so how far in that direction do you have to go? Because I hear what you're saying, and I agree with that. Yeah, I think right. so if it's 600 pounds and it's close range, yeah, you're in great shape. Yeah. But, you know, if you could shoot a 500 grain setup out to, you know, 60 yards if efficiently with a good speed and yeah. still get that same uh, outcome, you know, why Why wouldn't you? Because they have a humerus and they have an elbow knuckle and they have pretty stiff shoulder blades sure. and I'm not that good. So, so you're you're planning for the mar- I'm planning potential for me marginal a hit. and yep. hoping to God that my system will I, handle it. Well, and, yeah. and so not that... It's like, just a totally different mindset. Yeah, well, well, what but, kind of... Can I just ask, what kind yeah. of rod are you shooting to? I'm shooting a tough head, three, a 225 grain tough head, single bevel that's three and a half inches long by an inch and eighth wide. Hand sharpened, okay. great steel, has a 100 grain adapter in it, yep. and I have a 100 grain insert in the shaft. So I'm shooting 500 grains up front or something. So here, here's where I was going to flip that because this is uh, you <coughs> shoot. The reason you shoot your setup is I think the same reason that Jared and I shoot our setup, and in particular the broadhead, which is we shoot expandable, so crucify us if you want. That's fine. Um, because I, I shoot for a marginal hit to where I can't find blood. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's what took us away from fixed play. So, well, here, yeah, I'll t- let's talk about our setup. So, like, obviously, you know, not as much science uh, backing behind <laughs> it, but this this is how we came to it. We shot uh, fixed plates for a long time. a while, a while. Yeah, we were shooting uh, Ramcats and mm-hmm. yeah, 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 a couple other what we thought were solid fixed blade broad. I still do. I still think they're good broadheads. And uh, you know, we weren't shooting any kind of weighted arrows or anything mm-hmm. like that. Yep. And when we started to, to learn about, you know, we heard about these Eason Full Metal Jackets. I started to, you know, I talked to some guys at like Ethics Archery and some of these companies you probably heard mm-hmm. of. And so I'm like, oh, this is, you know, this is pretty cool. This makes a lot of sense. And so uh, we started building our arrows for for penetration. You know, mm-hmm. that was my main thing. It seems like, man, this arrow really seems to be the thing that is affecting our penetration. Not necessarily, mm-hmm. although it does have an impact. The, the broadhead. Broad yeah. So, like, you know, based on our poundage and stuff. So, so like my setup is I'm shooting a 80 pound Hoyt Carbon, uh, you know, RX RX five, RX5. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I've got a Victory VAP. Beautiful. 250. Yep. Okay. Stiff arrow. Uh, like micro diameter, and I've got an ethics archery outsert uh, yep. on the end of it. So yep. my, my total setup is like 470 grains. Yep. And uh, so in my opinion, and this is just from talking to guys, you know, and obviously I'm still learning, so I may change something based on our mm-hmm. conversation today. That's going to penetrate almost anything. Uh, and I can shoot that effectively out to 60, 70 yards. I'm, yep. still, I'm still getting about... Uh, you know, 296 feet per second, which gets me comfortably out to 60, 70. You know how fast it's going at 60? No. At that distance? Can we tell you? Not exactly, no. 240. Well, okay. And, well, but listen, though. 250. So, so the main thing that pulled us out of these fixed blade broadheads was ev- even at, you know, close range, 30, 40, 30, 40 yards on a, on a whitetail, um, you know, we were having some issues with, with just blood trails. Mm-hmm. Um, Where were you shooting them? What's your shot play? What's your, where do you aim? Well, I mean, ideally, shooting double ideally long. they're double long. What's lung, that? But what's what? Where, 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 if a deer's broadside, what are you aiming at? Just behind the How shoulder. How far behind the crease? Two inches. Okay, that's a rear. That's that's the, the lobe three and five, and liver. But it's a, that's why. Say, say it again. What do you mean? So physiologically, uh-huh. there's five there's five lobes in the lungs. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you're shooting the back two, mm-hmm. and the other three are fine, and they're in the forward. Mm-hmm. If you shoot fixed blade broadheads and move forward and shoot them right on front, of, right in front of the crease, and so you're shooting, they're going from here. They're going forty yards. You're putting it right through, and because you're confident with that, that momentum and that kinetic energy to push through. Your arrows would do it too. Because yeah. I mean, I well, will ours say are doing I'm that. Not. Like, like anymore, I'm shooting for almost shoulder blade. Like I'm not worried about. Well, and there's a hole. Well, listen, here's where you're really going to kick me. Yeah, yep. exactly. That's what I'm aiming for. Yeah. And I'm sh- we're shooting those uh, Rage Tripans. Yep. And uh, the reason for that is I know it's not the most durable broadhead out there, obviously. You could yep. go out and get a, yep. a single bevel. Yep. And from a penetration standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Yep. But my thinking is like, uh, you know, my arrow is going to penetrate damn near everything I shoot it at. Mm-hmm. What I want to compensate or to complement that is a big cutting surface with, yep. a, with a blood trail. Because yep. I've lost here that I know died mm-hmm. uh, just because I didn't have that blood trail. Yep. So for that reason, you know, we're shooting mechanicals. Yep. That's fine. I, I, I don't care. When, well, when, what I'm looking for when is... When they start failing, call me. <laughs> I mean, they have. Well, until just like that, anything, they until have. Until that point, I don't know that you need me, right? 
but I'm here. I'll be here. So well, but I mean, there is a, a perfect it's fine. example. There's good shots. Sure. Everything works. Yeah. Yeah, but well, I mean, obviously there's not one right way. Like I, we there, all know that. There's plenty of. I mean, I've shot close distance deer with that same setup, um, and essentially got, you know, seven inches of penetration single lung, you know, because I hit something right that I wasn't. Shooting straight down, That's basically. That's inconsistent deployment of the, of the broadhead. That's all that is. That slowed down, took all the kinetic energy away. Well, the blades don't open the same. So, ideally, a mechanical broadhead hits a perfectly flat surface yep. at a perfectly perpendicular angle, and they both deploy at perfectly the same time. This is what time. I want to hear. What, what is the symptom you're saying you saw? What happened? Straight down on so, that buck on the mountain, single lung, yep. and I didn't get, you know, I got six in six inches of penetration, it was at six yards with so that what, same setup. Yeah, right. So what happened yeah. is that the blade, one of the blades hit the tissue and opened. Mm -hmm. The other blade did not. Then that blade hit tissue. The ass into your arrow kicked down. Mm -hmm. Then the other one deployed. Mm -hmm. The ass into the arrow kicked up and it just sucks all the momentum out of it. Mm. Just take one. Just do this. Go to your house. Put it, whatever you're shooting, put it in your target at a quartering angle mm -hmm. and push it in real slow and watch it. Mm -hmm. And the inside blade will deploy. It will lay flat on the skin, whatever, target. Yep. The other one will be sitting there. Mm. And as you go in, the other one will deploy. Then it will deploy. And so what happens is the back of the shaft, it hits at an angle. This deploys. This does not. This is an open airspace. And the shaft goes like that. Got it. And then it opens, and the shaft goes like that. And the, there's yep. no momentum. Sucked out. Right, no that's my energy. biggest problem Interesting. with mechanical broadheads is that is not something you're going to beat. Which, frankly, is why I've avoided, and Jared has too, some of the mechanical broadheads that function primarily on exits. Because, frankly, you don't get them. Like, yeah. like no, a not, Schwacker. Like Schwacker, not about. to, like, pick on them. But, like, when that, when that, that goes in. I've had terrible luck with those <laughs> When that goes into the body cavity, right, it's a, it's a fill point. There's hole. no entry. And if you don't get an exit, there's no there's blood. There's no blood. I had them, um, and it opens like this and sucks. Every so I had energy out. those and over the tops, shoulder shooting pigs. So the problem with pigs is you have to shoulder shoot them. The physiology is not there. It's all jammed up behind that. It is what blade. it is. Yeah. And people shoot them three inches behind the crease all the time. Show me the video, and I'm like, don't even go. Straight guts. In fact, the son of the gun's probably fine. Like they'll Jeez. just shake that off. I mean, you'd be amazed how durable they just come back. So I unless shot, you get it in behind. It's got to be in front of the crease and low. Well, yeah, because like I, I would be. say, you know, and Jared's probably too, we, we wouldn't penetrate that shoulder blade on a Right, hog. on a nail guy, I'm going to have to shoot him in the same place. Interesting. Because the physiology's not back. Yep. I yeah. can shoot an arrow through one. Interesting. But well, so, it gets so to be challenging. What you're saying about the mechanicals concerns us, too. You know, yes. frankly, of our whole setup, that's the thing I'm, you know, least, least sure about. Like, oh, I guess I am sure that they, they malfunction sometimes. And so, like, Based on what you're saying, you know, if we could shoot a fixed blade that had the cutting diameter, which would give us the blood trail of, you know, this this Rage tripan, and I knew that it would fly as consistently as these Rages are. Well, you're shooting 80 pounds. You already have a 80s hard. I have a lot of people who have tuning issues at 80. Okay. So I don't know what the problem is at 80. Maybe it's just blowing out the spine. What do you think when we go up in poundage? Well, I think not tuning correctly. I think it's coming off the bow in a in a state that leaves it in a bad condition when it gets to the target. Right. Yeah. Right. So the one mainly from sp spine tuning. That that is certainly one thing that, mm -hmm. as and with a bear shaft, yeah. that's something Jeremy and I are not doing that done. I do think w would help. Yeah. No, it would help a lot. It would help your fixed blade work too. Right. And then you get something like a Magnus Stinger or the or the little that little Black Hornet. What's the this? The Magnus Black Hornet. Yeah. Okay. I call that thing the foamer. It is nasty. Really. It makes holes and stuff well i mean you're making a, a point here troy that is <laughs> frankly it's the same point that jared and i had when we built this setup uh, and i'm not saying it's perfect but it was that you know ultimately i'm not a world-class archer and i'm gonna make mistakes and i'm gonna make a marginal shot right? right and so my solution and jared's solution was oh let's cut a big hole yeah, on sure. entry i got you and like follow blood yours is i just want to make sure it hits dirt on the other side and it's probably gonna Kill. Which and, and let's talk about the same critter. Like you're shooting pigs, which I think if we were doing that, we'd also be shooting those six blades. Yeah, you're not shooting under 600 grains going to my place. Yes. yes. I will hand you my arrows. Yeah. Because what happens to people inevitably is one of my big ones comes out. Mm -hmm. And I've had this happen twice last year. Bonk. Yep. With fixed blades, they just hit something hard. 
Interesting. Then they stop. So where where would we if we're just whitetail guys primarily because that's what we are, and let's say we're shooting forty and in. I mean, what what what's a sweet spot there for for it, arrow weight? I would have you at five fifty. I would all I would do is load the front. I really? would not shoot a full metal jacket. Right. We I don't. would shoot a light carbon. You're shooting victories. Yep. Yeah, Those victories. are great. The outsert systems are great. They're good stuff. Yep. That's what we're shooting. I would add, shoot five hundred and fifty. Remember what I said, 500 to 550. And to do that, we're limiting range, and we're okay with that. You're still going to be able to shoot them 60. Open your pins up a little bit. They're going to fly. They're not going to slow down as fast. Well, and see, what we okay. know. So you're still going to have you're going to have your 60-yard shot. What we noticed, too, okay. is, and you, you and I talked about this. When we, when we first got into FOC, and given we're not Daryl, so, like, we're just trying to do our best and understand FOC. Yeah, yeah. The moment we embraced FOC, I remember shooting the first few arrows out of this, and I'm like, holy well, shit, look, that look flies here. great. Uh, this buck right here is, is one of the main uh, reasons. Why you got to do this? <laughs> that, we, that we started considering this. This is a big, you know, we think 10-and-a-half-year-old Kansas Beautiful whitetail yeah. that Jeremy stuck in the shoulder uh, yep. with our lightweight setups before that's we started why doing anything. I'm planning for that and break him. And... Uh, so, so that's what got us on this this course, and uh, I just I hate seeing that. This is your this story. Hey, not as much as we do. It's, it's the same <laughs> story I had I with, with the big hogs, right? Yeah, I killed a Pope and Young deer 15 years ago, and I don't care to kill another one. I don't know what the hell happened to me. I caught a nine and a half foot tiger shark in the surf after doing it for 15 years, and I don't care to catch a 14 footer. I just am weird. I am currently going to catch a 10 pound bass and a 30 inch speckled trout. That's my current problem and then you move life, on and then i'll move on what about hogs but i did i love shooting them so well i mean the world needs you to shoot them they need it right so this deer is the same story of my pigs mm -hmm. you kill the four points yeah you kill the call bucks yeah your does always get hit right for some reason yeah this guy doesn't get hit right no that's the deer i'm planning for you to have a chance to yeah. shatter well and i guarantee you with the setup you're talking about i probably would have killed that deer did you was the broadhead in him when you got him, or is this a shed? That's a shed. Oh, he's still out there. Uh, it yeah, went right into somewhere. the knuckle, low. Hmm. Right into the. We knuckle. saw him the next year. He was. He put he. Oh, he got scared. Yeah, leg yep. back, and I mean, I just. Choom. Yeah, so Aaron Warbritton cut that cut one and cut the humerus ball in half that two years ago on one that was a big. Was that that Iowa buck? Mm -hmm. The one that was kind of quarter and two or whatever. Mm -hmm. Hit a stick, redirected. I hit the humorous ball, split it, and went to the Called other side. Called a tracking dog because he thought it was going to be so right, far. He texted and it was me. Like, he sent me that video after he shot that deer, and he said, what do you think? And I said, is that the one Jake shot? Because Jake lost the deer. Yeah. And he said, no, I shot that deer five minutes ago. And I said, the arrow is in him because you could see the arrow carry with the deer. It yep. didn't flap. Yep. So the it was deer jumped, in. so it's in him. I said, yep. he's dead. He's 60 yards away. He said, everybody else says he's, uh, you know, you hit the bone. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, said, I was shooting worried 630 when I grains in a single bevel, bud. I think he's 60 yards away. He said, we call the dog. I said, fine. Right? They know not to go in. Don't stomp around. Yep. Don't yep. confuse the dog. They backed out. We talked to Shane last right. week. So I was like, great. I mean, why not? Yeah. Right? If you watch the video of his hunt, the dog comes out and you see it go like this. It's already got the deer. Because the wind's blowing uphill, the deer went downhill. You the, see the dog. They go, ended up getting that deer. Yeah, it was. It literally was like yards. right over the edge. Okay. So they like looked, and it was right there. Gotcha. And that's why Warbs. I mean, he shot completely through an elk full length too, and so he's kind of sold on the stuff. Interesting. Uh, we, but it's these deer. Yeah. yeah for sure, man. Well, when your brain's not. This working. This is that single lung deer that I killed. This was an <coughs> eight and a half year old mountain deer. I mean, this the head on this thing is a monster, right? Yeah. And that deer ran for two miles with one lung outside of its body. And I basically had to give it a heart attack for it to die. But Seriously. Like, it, I chased it until it fell over. I never got another so shot. So that was the deer we talked about where it just yeah. didn't go in? Yep. Yeah. But uh, before we get too far from it, I want to know, because you're saying you would even increase the weight on, on our setups, which, which we know may not limit distance that much, but will definitely decrease speed, correct? Right, but your momentum will go up. Your momentum values will go up even higher. You're going to talk about reactions? Well, <laughs> that, that's where I'm trying to draw the line in the sand is like, yeah, yeah where's the balance I want point? moment. Yes, absolutely. I want penetration. I want to pass through that thing every single time. But if I can complement that with a serious blood trail, which to me means a big cutting surface, mm -hmm. I want to, you know, and so... Well, that's what I was going to ask about your broadheads. But, and also on the topic of speed, though, like that, that concerns me because I actually was shooting 125 grain broadhead instead mm -hmm. of 100. Um, and I had a heavier ethics ulcer the year mm -hmm. before last. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I just 
was kind of lobbing. And I just, I didn't like it. I didn't like what could happen between me and an animal 40 yards away. Yeah, the jump the string thing is interesting. So I talked to Grant Woods about this. But not just jump in the string, but just movement. Just right, just anything. Move, but typically they're rolling away or yep, trying to something. do something. Yeah, yeah. They hear it coming. Reaction. Sure. I'm convinced they hear the arrow. Yes. I think they hear the bow and don't okay, know what that see, is. Okay, well, see, I've had some conversations, and I've had some weird conversations with guys that are like, listen, I don't care if that thing's going five miles an hour. They will not hear it, and they will not move. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. And that's an exaggeration. Wrong. Just obviously. go stand by a tree and have somebody shoot by you. What I'm saying, though, is just things happen, whether they hear it or not. Let's say they don't hear it. If they're, if they're just moving at all, things happen, you know, between right. here and 30 yards away. Right. And so, in my mind, I want to retain some speed for that reason. Yeah, you're gaining 20 feet per Accuracy. second. You're not gaining. You're not gaining 100 feet per second. Okay. You're gaining 20. So it's a small, small sacrifice. So that distance. I don't know saying. that it makes a difference. And then secondarily, the deer's reaction is a muscular reaction. It is not gravity. Right, right, right. So there's a couple of videos out there where people proved that Newton was right. They have something they drop. Mm. They average the drop. It is not that at all. Oh, that's interesting. They are physically moving their bodies and saying, Reaction. I've done this shit before, yeah. and I'm four years old, and some stuff chased me. Yep. I'm getting the hell away and find out later. Yep. So on video, I have 100% jumps. Every pig I've shot's jumped. I've got shoot forward. I've got roll. I've got drop. And then the worst is the drop and roll. The drop and roll, yeah. yeah. It's the worst. So here it comes your projectile, and it's hitting a moving target. Mm -hmm. And then the broadhead doesn't deploy evenly. Yep. And the ass of the arrow goes that way, and the target's going down and rolling further, expanding the amount of arrow wobble. Yeah. I call it impact paradox, yep. but at impact. So the broadhead system's a little inefficient. Mm-hmm. And we will never, there's no math that says they always drop four inches. No. Because you'll see people miss, completely miss a deer. The deer just jumps out of the way. We've all had it happen probably. Yeah. Yep. Right? I've, shot, I've had them wheel at me. Right. And a friend of mine shot at a diker in Africa three times, and the arrow <laughs> went through dirt. I mean, literally there's a dust ball, and, boom, and it came back and boom, 15 yards. And he was shooting a fast arrow, and they were, it was gone. Just <laughs> like, reacting you know, that pip fast. Line, right? Yeah. So... Since we don't know, once again, we're trying to narrow the variables. Yeah. One of the variables is we don't know where they're going or what they're going to do, or they're going to stand there and take it like a man. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take that. We love that one. Yeah, we like love that. that. Right? So we're got, we've got the, one of the variable things we can take out of it is can this arrow system handle something that's unknown? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for the, for the mechanical broadheads, you really aren't shooting far enough forward. And in my opinion, it's probably smart. You say should that, say shoot that again? decrease with well, the mechanical. Well, because if you shoot forward, you're going to hit bone and you're screwed. Well, the, the vital V is that big on a deer. Yeah. Oh, I see. So you're saying we should be shooting further forward, and a lot of times the mechanical doesn't allow for that. Because you know so what you saying. know from history mm -hmm. that it's better a little bit behind the crease. It's right. softer back there. Right. The rib cage physically is less. Yep. Mm -hmm. The ribs are lighter. That deer right there, um, <laughs> I shot with a fixed play. I shot that deer with a ram cap. This was within that same time frame of this deer. And I shot that deer forward, in my mind, forward, right? And that deer went 35 yards and right. caught up. And I mean, it you was just You shouldn't be shooting smoked. behind what you see there. Exactly. Yeah, I shot right through the middle of that. Right. So you see where the leg goes up. Yep. The humerus bone goes across. You can see the V. The V's on that deer right there. Yep. You can see that line going up. Yep. That's the edge of the shoulder blade. Behind that's ribcage. You should be shooting right in that pocket with a system that'll do it. And yep. I did with that deer. Then the next deer, that deer, I end up hitting that humerus bone and no right but then you had the downhill deer shot in where you're supposed to and it still didn't work so what, what i'm it's hearing just though, a really is, tough it's a, it's a hard equation it, it does a, sound like you're generally in agreement with our thought process on this maybe, maybe not the mechanical the i don't like the mechanicals because of the deployment problem but you understand why we're shooting that. yeah yeah right are you having issues with blood trails ever they don't go anywhere because huh. you're you're i'm shooting them forward I'm, I'm trying to cut their heart off so yeah let and well, it, see, because uh, I'm more concerned with accuracy. Like, I, I know that it's not perfect every time. So and, here's where well, I you just need to cut the fletchings off. And see, here's sure. where, that definitely yeah. is something I think would help. Here's where I'm going, though, based on what Troy and Daryl yep. are telling us is we're because we're shooting mechanicals, we're already aiming too far back. So then if we're marginal, we're probably back even further. Well, that's correct. 
absolutely. Versus if if we shoot, we're maybe I should be, but I, I'm not. Like that, I shot a I shot a, a buck in Ohio this year that was quartering towards me at like eight yard. I mean, he was right there. And uh, granted, you know, I've I've shot on a, ha- a handful of deer with this this arrow setup and stuff, mm-hmm. but I put that sucker right there. And I mean, he was he was right here, and I got a, a full pass through. Right. You the soft dirt behind it. Right. As of now, I haven't had an issue with, or haven't changed like my aiming based on that that broadhead mm-hmm. setup. And I, I think it's going to go through everything. It, that's fine. I would agree. I would say based on this conversation. Well, but, and, and also Troy, I'm an extreme too. Like I'm shooting an 80 pound. Well, see, that's where I was going to say. I think as you go further down range, I bet you don't have that much success because most not. of your kills have been. Well, we don't want to shoot. Far. I don't think we should be shooting far anyway. Sure. Yeah, but I would I, agree with I that. didn't say far 50, 40, 50 yards with his setup. He, he would kill the deer if he hits the right spot, but I don't think he's going to get the clean pass or his. Yeah. Because Pro- well, probably what you're not. saying, what's the drop off there for something even like his so, bow? So from back a to the math. Energy. The faster we go, the more they drag. Mm hmm. Okay. But why is that? Because. When they drag the same? No. Okay. No, they won't. The drag is proportional to the square of the velocity, V squared. Okay. So you go up two times in velocity, you go up four times in the drag. You go up okay. three uh, times in the velocity, you go up nine times in the drag. And what effect does that have? So what does that drag? That's when you hit meat. Say again? When you hit meat hot, going super fast, the drag goes up exponentially. Yeah. There's okay. a lot. Of, yeah. It's a, lot it's a weird deal because you have to fly it. Right, you can't shoot one foot per second. That's not going to work. Yeah, but it's not ever going to be a net negative, right? You're, st- it's still, it's not going to be what you expect. Sure, I can promise you that. So, sure. like Jared set up with an eighty pound. He's shooting seventy grains, probably heavier than I am on an arrow. Four seventy is my pounds. total setup. You're shooting what two ninety five feet per second ish. Yeah, I'm probably shooting two uh, eighties, low two eighties on yep. mine. Yep, but. I'm probably slower than him, so I would effectively have less drag on my setup than you'll you know. have less drag. That doesn't mean that uh, by the time you get to the target, the hill be going slower than you. That's probably not true. He's got right. more momentum, which that is what I mean by you can't net. have a net yeah, negative. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was well, and, and so to, the right way to do that is get a lab radar, shoot your arrows, learn, you know, know what you're doing at the target, not at the bow. Who cares what happens at the bow? I don't care what bow you use. Sure. Right. I care what's on the front of that arrow and what happens when it hits the animal. So are you right. setting that lab radar uh, or any chrono like right over the like part of the target you're aiming for? No, I set it. Uh, we set it right next to the bow. And it'll, oh. it'll and then it uh, measures five distances that oh. you set. And then it's, it's actually catching the. So we go 10, 20, 30, 40. And you put the target at 50. Yeah. And you've got to catch it flying. You don't want to catch it hitting the target. And, right. And what are you doing with that information? You find out, okay, here's here's the speed downrange. Uh-huh. And what then you, you can reverse engineer the kinetic energy out of the speed that you have at 40 or 50 yards. That's why I said um, my bow was running 75 or 78 foot-pounds with a 388 Out of arrow the arrow. At launch. Yeah, or out and of the bow, yeah. And at 60, it's 53 foot-pounds of kinetic energy. Wow. Hmm. It erodes that much. So one of the things that's interesting, and we'll have to do this, whenever we figure out how to, we're trying to figure out how to measure broadheads exiting. Yeah. We think we got it whooped. So we'd like to shoot, like I can snare pigs, and we can just get pig carcasses and cut the chest walls off. Yeah. They will be perfectly consistent, yeah, but at least it's a critter. Yep. We'd like to shoot at impact, known velocity, we know what that is, and then catch them coming out and try to figure out how to measure that. The lab radar won't shoot this way. It right, has to right, right. So that would be easy, but it doesn't work. I think that your arrow hauling ass fast, let's say it's a 100-pound bow. Mm-hmm. Let's say we're getting 330 feet per second. That 45-pound opening pressure that the rage that they're printing might be exponentially higher because of the velocity because it's dragging like hell. Because the drag. Remember, it's dragging. It's always flying. It's dragging on meat, but it's denser. We'll find... We'll, we got all kinds of crazy ideas, right? I mean, that makes it, I, and, and I guess, and I don't know about you, like I didn't even think about that. I'm thinking kinetic energy out of my bow, and I'm not even thinking about what it is down it was, range. It blew me away. Well, at least and That's what I'm me, presenting tomorrow. Right? I've got the slides, and it's just math, right? Yeah. It just sh- the erosion graphs go like this. Uh, all the way up my nine-year-old, I think grades. about that, right? Because right. I'm like, oh, he's not, he's not shooting enough kinetic energy to, get, to penetrate a deer, so he can't shoot a vertical bow yet, right? But, like, for me or Jared, like, it never crossed my mind. I'm like, yeah, it's plenty. Right. So the, the graph, 
goes, the kinetic energy at launch is the same. Mm -hmm. It's four, three or four foot pounds. It's basically nothing. Yeah. 3%. The changes, right. The change from. But the bottom graph at 60 goes like this. And the delta gets much smaller at 730, I think is the max mm -hmm. error. That's error I'm shooting from no guy. So that loss at 60 is terrifying. Yeah. Because we're not shooting a fast thing. I'm also right. going to talk about tank penetrators because of him. And they have a very, very, very heavy arrow. It looks just like an arrow, but it's going 5,000 feet per second because they have unlimited power supply. So they figured out what penetrates the tank, mm -hmm. and then they said, what's it going to take to deliver it? Mm -hmm. We don't care. Mm -hmm. How much boom? Because yeah, we got unlimited. plenty of boom. Yeah. It's unlimited power supply. We don't have that luxury. We have no power. Correct. 70 foot-pounds kinetic energy is a ballistic dud. Yeah. When you lose 20%, it's humongous. Wow. At the target. Yeah. So that's where a lot of people get mixed up with me is I'm worried about the target. Yep. Five years ago, I was... You and I were thinking exactly alike. Yeah. Let's just go 80. Let's bump the draw length up an inch. Yeah. Right? Let's just get yeah, it going. Yeah, just let it throw in a spear. And then your head starts to shift, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. It matters what happens at the target because we're trying to kill things. If you're shooting 3D, none of this matters. Right. Although right. I think... Well, I get it. Shh. But if you shot a 200 grain point, it'd be really as stable and efficient than bear shaft tuned for 3D. Don't tell anybody that. Oh, and I mean, those guys are shooting, you know, large diameter arrows and, they have, you know, they real listen, light. Let, uh, they have glue in points in them that are heavy and they're not telling anybody. Shh, don't tell anybody that. <laughs> but um, when your mindset becomes, I just want to get through the target, what's it going to take and what do I have to figure out to get it there and make sure it goes through every time? It's a completely different frame of mind. Yeah. And that's what I started as I've evolved in my channel. Thank God, because well, I would have been the same thing. I have content for years now mm -hmm. because of that guy and because of the math and because it just... That makes sense. The web just starts getting more clear. I mean, if anything, I, I feel kind of affirmed in our, in our way of thinking. Like, I... I we're agree. Not, I, I agree with we're almost wrong thinking. There, I think. There well, the are, difference is like, and I understand why. You know, because you, you guys are shooting these pigs and stuff, and you're, you're, you want that moment, uh, the momentum. Is that the right yeah, word? Sure. And I'm just remember, I'm half your age, so I definitely could be wrong. I'm wrong a lot. Yeah. I think that's an overestimate of half your age. I'm just, I, you know, exactly I, half. I don't think that I need that much. Yeah, and right. and if I can get that additional, so. I know how you guys feel about momentum and, and penetration. I, I get it, and I also think that's important. What, what do you think about blood trails? So let's say you don't hit the thing perfectly, mm -hmm. right? I just did a video on this, so okay. you will never control them. Blood trails. In fact, the next 10 deer you shoot, write them down. Okay. That's, you, you, I guarantee you've never done that. No. I've done it. Right, so, write what down? Write down the shot and then where you found blood. Mm-hmm. Okay. The next 10 deer. Like first blood? And average them. And, then, and also write down if you found them. Okay. Right? And I don't know that you're going to see blood right at the impact every time. Oh, I, I would say nine times out of 10, well, I don't. I did with that one. But not, you shot him where you're supposed to. That's yeah. not necessarily. I, it, it's kind of a subjective thing. It's just a, it doesn't is become, this blood it doesn't trail follow if not. you get a spreadsheet. My average shot to blood distance is 35 yards at the ranch. Well, yes, but... I wrote it down. But that shot to blood is not necessarily as important as blood quantity in general. Right? Internal blood. Because you're going to see it run 35 yards more than likely. Correct. So, but internal blood or external blood doesn't matter. We want shitloads of blood exiting. Well, it does matter. The system. Yeah, because if you don't see them die, you want external blood. But if they're bleeding internally massively, they're not going anywhere. So they're going to get a, a hemothorax. But what if they're not? You know, what if it's a you're poor not shot? Get a blood trail anyway. Where's the blood going to come from on a gut shot, right? Well, sure. I, I guess so, I guess all what I'm arguing or, or saying I guess is like if I make a poor shot on an animal, which is likely we all knowing do it. me. No, no, man. <laughs> no, it's not you. Right. Even though I'm trying Everybody to make in here needs yeah. To admit even though I'm trying to make up. ethical sh <laughs> ethical shot, things happen, you know. And so, I'm with you on the blood or on the on the guts. 
there isn't going to be much blood no matter what. It's mostly because there's hay in there. Yeah, but but if I'm nick, if I nick a lung or you know if I get a, a lethal shot or even liver. if it's not lethal liver, livers I'll, have no blood pressure. I, I, I want to have the opportunity to blood trail that thing as effectively as possible. Yeah, I agree. And if I'm in my mind, if I'm shooting a small fixed blade broadhead, I'm not going to have as good of an opportunity as if I was shooting a big mechanical right. seems to be what offers that right no there's no doubt if the hole's bigger you got a better chance of getting the blood out of them yes yeah. i got no and even muscular bleeds let's just let's just say yeah. you clip the back of the shoulder meat yep and we've all cut ourselves yep. you'll get some blood right yeah. what you want to see is that spray coming out of their damn nose well and try not, <laughs> try not only that the thing we haven't talked about is just for forgiveness like if i'm you know if i'm if, if, if it comes down to an inch or two behind that liver which i, I know is splitting hairs but like you know, that, that big cutting surface gives us that forgiveness that maybe a small one doesn't, even mm -hmm. though, you know, I know the penetration is the and idea. And that was our that. initial right. thinking. That's our idea. Yeah, right. Forgiveness and blood trails. That right. said, I can't shoot at the shoulder with my, I won't, at least maybe Jared will. I won't because I don't think that I'm going to get, right. I'm not, I'm not going to hit vitals. So I'll or I'm going to hit, uh, well, I'm going to feel like so I'm going to so redo this. Have, have yep. You want so, a beer? We got a beer in here. <laughs> yeah, we might have a beer, yeah. yeah. You want one? No. Oh, actually, sure. <laughs> That'd yeah. be fun on podcast. Yeah, we're allowed. The drinking man. So. We got, what do we got? Yingling? High life, High bush life. Is it cold? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And yingling. I don't care. <laughs> Hardly picking up. My son gets mad at me because we go to bars. I say, I want some brown whiskey. And he goes, you're not that cool, Dad. Just tell him which brand. Uh, I'm see, like, I'm a little picky on my bourbon. Yeah, but half the bartenders it. are just like, hey, uh, okay. Carol's in. I'm in, sure. We tried to. We're having a beer pause. Make them stay uh, with us. In oh no, they're they're with us. Um, okay, so I'm going to show a very simple example. Yes, please. Of what y'all what y'all are trying to work around here. There's a few. I'm, of those I'm glad Troy that from, you're seeing uh, our thought process. We're we're, we're on fine. the same. We're page. on the same page. We're on the same sure. page. Here. All right. So <clears throat> we're going to say this is a shoulder blade. Okay. Okay. And we're going to say this is the vital V right here. Yep. And the humerus is here, and you can shoot all of the blue. I'm going to put it there. The camera's, that's my, that's my camera, right? Yep, this is your camera. Yeah. Okay. We'll put it this way. Roughly speaking, the kill zone behind the shoulder blade is about like that. Okay. On a deer. Okay. Okay? Shoulder blade would be much smaller. Yep. Going to have to imagine here. Use your imagination. Y'all are aiming... To hit that. Yes. The That's back. behind the crease, right? Yes. Well, why wouldn't you increase the shot? Yeah. The amount of stuff you're shooting at and come forward. Well, because I, 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 I figure I do I'm going to hit the humerus with my expandable. Understand, but you're you're risking going liver gut back here. Yep. Agree. That is the liver. Agree. The Agreed. liver's very low blood pressure and very high in the thoracic cavity. So most people think the liver's low. It is not. The hepatic artery comes right off of the right off the uh, abdominal aorta, and it's hanging. Mm. So liver shots typically don't press blood out. They are, it's a low, it's a very low blood pressure organ, and everything, gravity tends to pull the blood down. Okay. Lethal, four hours. Yep. That sucks. We're all over I the board that. with a liver, yeah. Right. Now, if you hit one in the liver, a mechanical is your best friend, because it's going to make a massive hole in that. Yes. Yep. And then it'll just but drip and We are run talking out. about... You could shoot down here a little more forward I and agree. have all this to aim at. Yeah. Or we're risking. 100% agree. So that's kind of how my head thinks. And then secondarily, right in the vital V is where the largest vessels physiologically are in the animal. So mm -hmm. if you sever the aortic arch coming right out of the heart, mm -hmm. which is about this far above the humerus, straight up the leg. It doesn't matter if they bleed or not. They're not going anywhere. Sure. I'll give you an example. You'll see this. You're going to see this. You'll think about this when you've done it, and then you'll see it on other videos. You'll see somebody shoot right through the shoulder blade. The deer kind of hops, and then they start wobbling. Mm -hmm. That's called cardiogenic shock. The blood is leaving their, their body so fast, it's leaving their legs. Mm. It's all internal. Mm. That's why they don't run. People are like, yeah, it didn't run off, got the wobbly. Well, you're damn right. There's The body says trauma in the front. Bring it. Suck it in. Yep. And it's a closed system. Mm. There's no more blood going in. So when they get the wobbly legs and don't run, it's called cardiogenic shock. 
and it's the best thing on the damned earth. <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> well, obviously that's that's what you want. Well, I mean, every time I, I wish they would drop right there. You know, that, I think, that would be amazing. I think to again, and this was, I think we kind of knew there was a sacrifice in it. Is that if we shot mechanicals and in, in whether it's rage or NAP or whatever you're shooting, we were sacrificing some of those vitals in and behind that leg, front leg in order to have a bigger well, entry Well, yes, hole. I think a lot of guys are, you know, self-correcting. They know that. But I built our arrows so that we didn't have to. Like, I was I was of the mindset that, yeah, I know that that Rage Tri-Pen is not as durable as a, a single bevel, yeah, any right. kind of fixed blade. I yeah. know that. But I, I want to believe that it is durable. It's got to be one of the more durable two-blade broadheads. And with that arrow that I've got behind it, at least right now, I feel confident. I'd put it right on that shoulder. We'll talk. You need to go over there. Well, over where? VIP. Okay. T to Just check saying. out the broadheads? Mm -hmm. Daryl, you're we're welcome not, to bring one of those over here if you want to check it out. Or We're not loyal to anyone. <laughs> No, we're, no, we're, try, we're just trying to deer. learn. No, We've right. shot them a lot. I just want to kill deer. Me and so Daryl and I have a we're getting ready to build a secondary company to start doing testing for take all comers, arrows, broadheads. We don't care. Yep. High speed camera, math genius, full reports, all that stuff. Whatever you mm -hmm. want to find out. Mm -hmm. And we've done a lot of testing on a lot of different stuff. And so some of the there's some new designs that are coming out in the mechanical world i've never said that mechanical broadheads are a no-go i've just said they're not there yet sure well and somebody's going to figure it out and what they should do brandon mcdonald asked me this he said would you rather shoot a 400 grain arrow with a um with an iron wheel on the front mm -hmm. or shoot a 650 grain arrow with a sever and i said i'd shoot the sever but i'd break the blades off and he said I didn't ask you that, and I said you didn't say I couldn't. Yeah. So I would reduce the broadhead width to one inch, but take the mass. Gotcha. Um, what, what do you mean you break the broadhead, the blades off? So the blades so are much, two inches wide. So much kinetic energy, it just bust them, yeah. bust them straight. So they're off. not two inches wide. It cut it down to an inch and a quarter. Oh, okay. Shorten the blades. Literally, take a grinder. So not and just get rid of them. them. Shorten mm -hmm. them. Just shorten them up. Okay. Okay. And then I would have much, uh, much more efficient projectile on impact. Yeah, this deployment thing would be reduced because it wouldn't be such an angle. Right. H have you done? Because because we're circling this like range of like you're right here with this penetration, and I'm like right, and we're not far. But like, have you done a lot of shooting with with that that real heavy arrow setup, high poundage? Um, no poundage, forty pounds. Well, that'd be the difference, <laughs> though. So I've shot a lot of animals with forty pounds and seven hundred grains. Yep. Meat axe. Hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I'm not saying you can't do it. <laughs> Have you had issues, though, with, like, if you were to shoot that, <laughs> why wouldn't you just shoot that 650 grain with the full sever? Like, do you really not think that you're going to get the penetration I, that you need out I of think that? The, I still think the mechanicals are going to re redeploy, and they will kick the ass of the arrow. Huh. What he's described on this deer mm -hmm. will happen at 1,000 grains. Okay. It's still going to pre-deploy. I see. Possibly. And the arrow is still going to, it's 29 inches long. Yeah. Uh. And the broadhead has a ton of leverage and a very short, it's a very short lever arm yep. and can really crank and the back of the shaft just goes like that. And that's what I was going to, Daryl, is there a scientific, like, what is that scientific piece that Troy's talking about there with like the way that thing deploys and how, is it just how the energy is passed back or kicked back to the back end? Yeah. Let's talk about that for just a second because it's, let's there's, do it. there's something really interesting <laughs> that, that, that goes really on like there. The severs. I do yeah. like those. Okay. Um, so. When you first launch an arrow, what what this is called in the defense world is called a base push projectile. You're pushing it from the back end. Slide up there, buddy. Yep. Okay. So <laughs> pull the mic. Hello, hello. You're good. Yeah. So when you uh, when you shoot a base push projectile, you're going to bend the you're going to set that up in a condition like a guitar string that mm -hmm. it's going to bow. Mm -hmm. And people think, well, it might bow at the at the beginning, but by the time it gets down the target, everything's straight. It's just that one little flash. And at this point that's in that. the discussion, at least as the average bow guy, I'm thinking spine in my mm -hmm. head. That's that's what's coming into my mind. Yeah, of like, that's a that's a good that's. And the I'm right putting it in layman's terms yeah, for, right. for us bow guys. Right. So right. so you typically shoot a heavier spine off a compound bow because a trad bow needs that spine to get around. You know. Yep. Get around and and shoot in the direction you're looking. But uh, that doesn't go away. 
It's like if you take a tuning fork and you bang it on the table and you sit there, you know for seconds that tuning fork is going to vibrate. Yep. Many seconds. Oscillations, right? yeah. Yeah, guitar strings the same way. Mm -hmm. Your arrow is doing the same thing. Now, when you hit the target, you're already coming along at some bending frequency when you hit the target. But when you hit the animal, you're putting exactly the same amount of energy, almost exactly the same amount of energy into the arrow again as you did when you launched that arrow. Mm. So it might be bending a little bit before it gets there, but when it hits the animal, think about it. If your arrow slowed down yeah. over the length, mm -hmm. right, that means it got as much deceleration through the animal as it got acceleration off of the bow. And that deceleration will force that arrow to begin bending again. And the energy it, has to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. well, that's what, yeah. I I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's got to go somewhere. In your mind, you want it to continue to push it and carry it through. In this case, it's pushing, it's basically kicking it. Back. And well, that's the reason for FOC, right? It's like because when you hit that secondary point, the fact that most of the weight is up front, is that going to that's going to reduce the amount what's going to happen there's a couple of things that'll happen one is is all of the inertia is at the front of the arrow yep. right. right you're not stacking the arrow from the back if you're if all of your mass is at the yeah. center of the arrow yeah. right it'll tend to bow up around that center right yeah. right and then then you've got uh what we would call uh crater wall interaction that's a full metal jacket wall, situation sidewall exactly. swipe that's correct exactly Absolutely. right yeah. and when you do that what you're doing is that that arrow is slapping back and forth the broadheads redirecting during yep. the course of that we shot some mdf and we saw a lot of the broadheads these uh a lot of broadheads redirect through the mdf because of the arrow flexing as it as it went through the mdf yeah. i'm not saying mdf is a good test medium that's just sure. what we saw and so so to think that your arrow is hitting perfectly straight and it's going to continue in the, the line you're going especially for a low foc arrow where the where the center of gravity is near the center of the arrow that thing, that center of gravity is going to move back and forth laterally as that arrow begins to penetrate and continues to penetrate. If you move the FOC forward, makes perfect sense, right? You're carrying all of that energy into the target, and the amplitude of that bending is going to be less, and the frequency is going to be higher. I, I remember thinking that, Daryl, as, as soon as we like, you know, we saw a guy shoot these full metal. Jack I shot them for for a season. Yeah, I know. And then started to dig. I'm into, sorry. Started, yeah, me too. Started to dig into like why. Uh, and it's because of this this weight and FOC, and I was like, well, this doesn't solve this. This is just heavier, not yeah. in the right way. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's correct. And I've did this with a couple of people who came to the ranch with full metal jackets. And since I'm sponsored by Sirius, I have every arrow on the planet. So people come into camp, and all I do is I give them a lower grain per inch carbon, yep. and, and put 225 up front. It. And Not it's, hard. Yeah. It's like 35 grains heavier than the full metal jacket, but the forward to center goes from 8% to 16. Yep, there you and go. it's the same arrow, basically. Yeah, yeah. 525 grains. Yep. And they just... A lot of guys missed it that year. Right. The, yeah, the year that full metal jacket. A lot of guys well, went with that. And, and I will say this. <laughs> if we have a Myself beef... Myself included. If we have a beef... And this doesn't fix the whole what deploying of the, the blades. No, but if we have a beef with the expandables, it's the fact that you can't find 150 grain expandable broadheads, right? It's, and in fact, we can barely find 125s. I know Sever makes them, but most of them are 100 grain broadheads and that's it, well, which is why we stack all the inserts. That's I don't know driven if it's by Hunter. Help. You don't I, think so? I don't. <clears throat> the only thing I could possibly see- It'd help see, our FOC if we could do it, but- Right, it, you still gotta get them to fly. So every yep. time, so warning to everyone listening to this podcast. If you change the point weight at all, you got to retune the whole damn thing. Mm -hmm. Do not s s tune up with a 100 grain insert and 125 grain point, shoot bare shafts, bullet holes, life's good, and then decide you're shooting 200. Yeah. You have completely changed the stick. Mm. Yep. 100% the stick changed because it's going to flex different. Backing up. I don't know. So the. Thing, if somebody built a 150 grain mechanical, they could go steel. They could get better blades. Mm -hmm. That's what, if I was building. Which is a why we picked the head, tri pan because it has some of the better blades it? in the I titanium, titanium, right? That's what it, I would put the best steel blades I could in there to make them as sharp and durable as possible because the yep. entry angles are horrible. Yep. Yeah. Per they this. come in like this yep. and hit bones. Yep. How many of you guys chop bones with a knife and just slam on them like that? Right? We don't do that. Mm -mm. You do it with a with a maul, or yeah. you do it with a breaking bar. Yep. But or go around them if you can. The fact that they're coming in at such a parachute 
Yep, I, I hear you're you. You're really going to damage. The edge is not designed to cut that way. It's designed to cut across. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I would I, I would put it's it all into the better blade systems and more steel and thicken them up. That's where the heavier broadheads. Well, and then why in the hell is this industry back on the damn track of like lighters better? I mean, the, most of these guys. No, in it's this, not. Most of these guys in this building do not make an expandable heavier than 100 grains. Well, we're, we're I'm st- we still haven't touched anybody. I bet I haven't touched five percent of the market yet. I mean, that's I'm just saying that's what most of these people <coughs> are, are. It's hundred grain options is what we want, what we have for now. And I'm not saying that's for everything for, or for mechanical one twenty five. Well, dude, that's driven by hundred demand. <coughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but the there hundred doesn't a, know any better. There's nothing heavier than hundred fifty in the building. The hundred, the hundred doesn't know any dude, better. Dude, we could get the product development guy from Fairdyne over there. He'll tell us, you know, the reason we don't make hundred fifty grain. Because uh, they don't sell them. Rage right, Tripan the is because, yeah, nobody wants them. They, they because, want but grand. it's because the market doesn't know that there could be something better. They only know what they have. I'm That's why all the all the really good stuff is internet-based. Chicken and egg, the man. Tough ads and all that yeah. stuff. Are, yeah. They're not in the building. But the Annihilator has 150, and, right? Yeah, they have a 150. Cabela's so and Shields and these guys won't pick them up because they won't move off the shelf. Because nobody great. knows they need an... 200 grain broadhead or whatever it is. Well, that's honestly, that's going back to the misinformation that's out there or the lack of information that's out there in the archery community. Again, you know, there are a lot of technical people in the archery world, and and I'm not saying that anybody's smarter than anybody else. The fact is there's no forum or no place to deposit that technical information. It used to be archery talk, frankly. Yeah. And then that fell off the face of the earth when it got acquired. Well, I'm looking for something a little different. What I'm talking about is something where you have peer-reviewed Papers oh. that are that are in a symposium, like a real forum, a, a yeah. real forum, yeah, and yeah. then you got the best of the best. It's been sorted through. That's stored in a location, and yeah. then you go and and the industry and everyone goes and looks at that. And they said, "How come you're not doing this? We want." Well, the this. problem is, is this industry for as long <laughs> we as we got a long way to go <laughs> is, yeah, sure. is is financially driven through the mouths of celebrities and sponsorships, and it doesn't matter. And frankly. You know, and they won't tell you. I guarantee there is a handful of guys in this building who are repping a product who they've never, they've never even used because they won't use it because they know it's shit. Yeah. It but happens. because it, that's who has the money. Yeah. What are they going to do? Yeah, that's the challenge with you know trying to make money in this world and shoot the crazy stuff. I yeah, shoot. but this industry, this industry is unique. Like in this in the sporting world, I get it. Right. Ultimately, like you know, uh, there, this endorsement's going to come down and you're going to wear this shoe, you know, football player A or basketball player B. But ultimately, those guys play a sport to where they don't have to pay to play, right? Most yeah. of these guys who are doing TV shows who are looked at at the celebrity side, yeah. minus the YouTube aspect, yeah. have to pay to play. They're on a network. They're on Outdoor Channel because they paid Outdoor Channel $100,000 mm-hmm. to be on there for the quarter. Right. That, that's, that's why, and, and no knock to them, but we talked about Pursuit Channel, well, somewhat of a knock, and if people say, well, why the hell does that channel even exist? There's mostly shit shows on it. It's frankly because they find people who are willing to pay 50 grand a quarter to put their show on there and be a hunting celebrity. Yeah. That's got to be a tough way to make a living. Yeah. Let me give you a technical example. Just a very simple technical example. When's the last time you heard somebody say, hey, what's the ballistic coefficient of that arrow? None. Never. I hear Never. it in my long range shooting that I do. Maybe. Probably not. Probably not. Because the ballistic coefficient is not something that's routinely discussed, yet it has everything to do with how that arrow. Well, is I say my long range shooting. I mean guns. My yeah. long range gun shooting. Yeah, yeah. I hear that. Everyone knows, right? The Creedmoor has a great ballistic coefficient. Yes. Right. But in archery, we, no, we don't talk about that. It's, yeah, and the reason is it's misinformation. It's misinformation or lack of information. But the ballistic coefficient is, is exactly what controls the trajectory of that arrow. How much speed is bled off as it goes down range? You could have a very high drag broadhead, a very high drag arrow, but if you have enough mass mm-hmm. to counteract that, you have a very high ballistic coefficient. Well, guess what? You're going to hit that target with a lot of energy and a very high velocity. So you get your kinetic energy, you get your momentum, but even with a high drag. But we don't talk about that. And it's frustrating to me that we have, we, these things are just things that fly through the air. Mm-hmm. We know how to do that. We know how to calculate the drag. We know how to calculate the lift. We know how to calculate ballistic coefficient. We know how that affects the flight. But here, it's all marketing. It's all, it. yeah. it's all marketing. We need to change that. And the way we're going to change that is from both ends, from these types of uh, podcasts, the channels, right, that bring it up from, from the ground up. 
<laughs> and then from the top down, I'm here from the top down to talk to the industry about having a technical symposium, having a place where we can store technical information that talks about, hey, how, you know, what's the, what's the momentum? What's the kinetic energy? How does that drop going down range? What's the drag of the arrow? How does that change the velocity of the arrow as you go 60, 80, 100 yards? Do we really need to be shooting 60 and 80 and 100 yards if our dispersion pattern, let's say the drop of the arrow is three inches at 60 yards, but our dispersion, we can't shoot more than six inch groups. Do you know that that means that there's more than a nine inch uh, uh, maximum extreme spread between the bottom of the arrow group and the top of the arrow group between your broadheads and your field points? Who's hmm. talking about that? Nobody. Nobody. Why not? We're talking about flying things. You're not going to necessarily shoot that great. 3D is a different thing. You've had four warm-up shots with the fat yeah. friends. You missed one, and then you say, hey, I made a 70-yard shot. Well, your first five were yeah. not let's, so let's awesome. Get these guys, let's get them to do the, the Rocket Man yeah, we're challenge. Gonna, we're thinking about doing the Rocket Man challenge, so you all, you all need to put some input in this. Okay. okay? We want to do one cold shot. Okay. you got to either run 60 yards and come back and shoot within 20 seconds or do, like, 20 push-ups. Okay. And I'll run. Do, Jared will do push-ups. You can do two sets of, you can do 10 <laughs> sets of two, however you get to 20. Okay. All right. right. You and I can do 20 <laughs> 30 push-ups right now. It would take 10 but most sets, people but yeah. would die. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then you got to grab your bow and shoot 60 yards, one shot, okay. and send it to us. Okay. So no, should we, should we do that for a week? One shot And every document day. each one of them? Okay. No, and send us the group size. Should we run that? Should we run? Or push-ups? Or what do you think we should do? We want some stress. You're excited. Here comes your elk. I mean, if you running, it's gonna get the heart rate going. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, it push-ups are to gonna do be some kind of a burpee. Would like be a arm fatigue. Burpees. Yeah, uh, any kind of a cardio. Burpees suck. Yeah, yeah. they're still like good an, for no, you. In other so words, an aerobic. I was something. trying to be practical, so what I would say is, hey, walk down. Well, put guys, your, guys do that, right? I know guys that are doing western hunts. That's how they prep for them because they. I they, hope so. Right. Yeah. So, so I do. Put your target up at sixty yards. Run back to your bow, and within ten seconds, fire your arrow. You get one shot. You're done. The next day, do the same thing. Walk mm -hmm. down to your target, run back to the run yep. back to the bow, pick up your bow in ten seconds, fire it. <laughs> do that five times at sixty yards, and tell me what your group size is. Okay, mm -hmm. right? And just uh, with a fill point, you can do a fill point if you want to do broad. And, and what are we what are we hoping so, to find with this? I want to know what the what the average. What the true average, so people tell me who sell broadheads, man. I oh, I can shoot a two inch group at a hundred yards. Okay, and I'm like, I bet you cannot. I bet you can do that if you shot 20, 30, 50, 100 shots every day. For and the that's last why you're month. saying true cold, like true, true cold. cold, one shot. What, what, is the, yeah. what does the cardio element have to do with that? Well, so that's just a stress the, element for being under Well, I understand that, running. but that's yeah. obviously going to make the results well, worse. It's more realistic. Yeah, right. Heart, heart rate is uh, yeah. Big if you got four warm-up shots and then you got to take your cold shot, you have four warm-up shots before it. So you Who's going to take a warm -up, all that? Uh, warm up shot off of, your, off of your tree stand? You're gonna right. shoot four warm-up shots. No, and no, no. Wait for you to do. No, but you, I'm also not gonna run. Shot. I'm also not gonna run. 60 well, yards. there's a buck fever element to that. You know, sure. the buck shows up. It's a. It's, I'm with you. You know, it's great. It's big. We there's might do no, I, I, just in, in I, April, listen, I think we may do the deal in in Stonewall. We may do both. I think for the sake we'll, of accuracy of your of your test, based on what you guys are trying to figure out, I don't know that the cardio element is necessary. I, I think that is realistic in a, a yeah. hunting scenario. I think that, that's, that's what I, I want to know. I think that's I a level B. I would do yes. almost like a control, yep. which is just walk out 60 yards, shoot one, cold. Agreed. Right. Then maybe the next week, you know, do that a full week. The next week, do your cardio 60 cold. And uh, you're 100% right. That is going to be <laughs> drastically broader. That's I, th what I, think. I still think the cold will there's be no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, doubt. we all know that. Like, I, There's certain days that my first shot, and I'm like, money. feel good about it. There's yeah. other days I'm like, fuck. Oh, no. <laughs> oh damn it. Who my was shooting that bow? Mad. Yeah. My mom's going to yell right. at me now. See what well, you look, did, Troy? If, if we did that. Sorry, Mom. Let's say we did that, and we we said we could set an industry standard to say, okay, this is this is an average dispersion for guys who, who uh, want to go hunt. Yep. Elk hunt, doesn't matter. Whitetail hunt, whatever. Their elevated heart rate, all of that is in consideration. What you would find is you'd shoot shorter than you normally do. So I was going to say, is that potentially the, and I, you know, listen, this industry, people don't listen anyways, but the hope would be to say, hey, listen, 60 could be too far. Mm -hmm. Just, just, it would be a funny, it would be a funny yeah. test, right? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Start that way. I'm all for Start it. Start being fun, but it, it becomes science all right, really we'll quickly. Do it. So <laughs> we'll document, be we'll humbling document for sure. a cold. The Rocket Man Challenge. We'll Rocket do, Man we'll, Challenge. We'll document a cold 60 for a week, and then we'll do the cardio 60 for a week, and we'll mm -hmm. give you the results. Yeah, that's great. And if you want to add extra excitement, put your favorite broadhead on the front. Okay. 
right? And now I don't know what my favorite broadhead is. <laughs> Whatever that is, so take your field point off, put your broadhead on there. Yeah. I, I will say that is the, the big negative of at least us with Rage Tripans is I shoot that thing into a target and it's shit <laughs> that I got to go get another one and they're expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's for the Tripans, but for certain models, I know they make like a, a mm -hmm. practice that's supposed to be pretty one close. One of the Rages used to do it. A G5 does it with their... I think it was the 2.3. Yeah. It was like the extreme. I'm really mm -hmm. interested to find this out because uh, here's one of, the, one of the things I've tested. In fact, Troy and I tested this together out of my arrow gun, which takes the bending out of the arrow so yeah. so we shot a ton of field points with uh how long is that air? um is it's it a standard bolt. shaft yeah it's a bolt. It's a, it's, oh it is it's a bolt. about 20 22 inches so, so like bolt that. out of crossbow yeah uh only it's the traditions crack shot arrow gun yep right pressurizes the front yep. takes the bending out and so uh we shot three percent foc 13 percent foc and 25 percent foc and all of those field points at 40 yards hit the bullseye hmm all hit the same spot. Not, you a, took not a lot the of bend weight. Same, same weight. Same weight. Everything's the same. I just we put a brass FOC. ring on it and just move the forward to center around. Mm -hmm. So we okay. put it in the back, put it in the middle, put it in the front. Oh, cool. So the sh yeah. yeah, the point of this is to show you that just because you have a certain percentage FOC for your field points doesn't mean your arrow is going to fly the same when you have that same FOC for a broadhead. Because of the drag? Yep. Because of the lift. Because of the lift. Yeah, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Come on, Jeremy. But lift. Told yeah. you I was terrible at <laughs> physics. Yeah. yeah, because of the lift. <laughs> Can I ask two two quick questions? Because we haven't we've addressed a lot of the front, uh, and we we did partly on the the helical of the veins. But a big debate between like let's say a two inch blazer and a four inch uh, of like my four inch is more stable. The other part would be, and Jared and I have this back and forth, is lighted knocks. Um, I've personally just had a, a shitty flight with lighted knocks. Maybe it has nothing to do with the lighted knock itself, but. Uh, you know, versus a traditional. So model. I'll do the Lua knocks first. Okay. Some brands are not accurate. And the, when you change the knock, you change a lot. Okay. Knock fit, knock because shape, the, okay. just the knock. Yep. Okay. Just literally the knock. So. And then you're adding weight to the ass end, which is the worst the biggest place thing. to put it. Yeah. That And that's why I kind of bailed on it. But you I mean, is there a way to. With, with lighted knocks. Okay. And, and then stick your stocks back in and the weight went away and you'll be fine. Okay. So if you're going to bear shaft and you're going to shoot lighted knocks, bear shaft with lighted knocks. Yep. And then when you put the stock knocks in, the tail weight comes off and they'll shoot pretty damn close. Okay. okay. But if I want to continue to shoot with lighted knocks, just bear shaft it with the lighted knocks in first. The, correct. Gotcha. And then um, the one, the any lighted knocks, sorry, industry with the sleeve systems, you should not be hunting with those. Those things are not that consistent. What do you mean, sleeve systems? They have ones that where the the, the base knock is a certain diameter, and, and then you fit, put the sleeve in. It'll fit a two six four, a two zero four, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you any, are, it, just generally speaking, any one size fits all is not going right. to be your best. So case. we've Got actually it. found, um, and they're not sponsors of mine, but we found the Luminock to be one of the most accurate knocks. Interesting. Consistently. I mean, they're yeah. the. I mean, they're the original, right? Well, they use a stock boning real knock. Yep. With a little deals on the side that bite yep. into the shaft so it's a stock knock and everybody else is reproducing the knocks got it and we found them to be more accurate and I, i'm when i go nail guy hunting which may be a spot and stalk thing in february i'm not shooting lighted knocks got it i'm not i mean it just it's a big damn animal i gotta shoot in the right place i'm not having a lighted knock make it just just and that's been again if it happened I just yeah. want my dumb arrow to be as dumb as possible. Yeah. Just a stupid projectile coming okay. off. How about fletchings? I can try that. Hit yeah. it, Daryl. Oh, uh, <laughs> we're going down the rabbit hole now. Okay, what's your question? So basically, you know, um, and it really was probably when the like the whisker biscuit came out. Of, but a lot of people shoot it's pronounced whisker biscuit. Whisker. Whisker. Uh, the two inch like blazer vein, right? Uh -huh. Two inch versus I, a lot of people say, well, no, don't shoot that two inch. Shoot that four inch. It's more stable. Okay, let me ask you a question. What stabilizes an arrow? I have no Is idea. It lift or drag? <laughs> we just went over my physics. Grade, it's fifty so. fifty drag. Lift. Oh my gosh, it's a lift. Yes. But why? 50, 50 and I've but my why, math was why is it lift? Why oh, the lift stabilizes an arrow. Um, okay, I'll try to explain this. Yeah, hit me. I can do that with, yeah, pick up with Jake. With Jake. Big Jake. Dumb big brain. Jake. Jake's big arrow. Jake. Big Jake. Big Jake. Yeah. I had to cut Big Jake down a little bit to get in the suitcase, but okay. <laughs> okay, this is Big Jake. All right. So when an arrow flies, that yeah, I'm going to pick this up. Under Thank you. Mm. There you go. Now we're Hello. Good. Yes. yes. Okay. When an arrow flies, 
like this, what happens? It pitches up. Yep. It gets lift off the broadhead. Yep. It gets lift off the fletching. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the arrow is flying, it's pivoting around the center of gravity. Yep. What makes the arrow stable is this lift times this torque arm to the center of gravity. And this is unstable. It tends to push the arrow up. To stabilize that, it's the torque arm from here to your fletching and the lift that's created by the fletching that brings the arrow back down. Okay. So the, st the, the stabilization of an arrow comes from the fletching, mm -hmm. right? Not from drag, because the line of action of the drag is along the arrow, right? right? But the line of action of the lift, right, is, up. is way far away from the yep. center of gravity. It. So just a little, it's like a seesaw on the playground yep. or a torque wrench. Well, uh, like a is that a fulcrum in the middle or am a I fulcrum? Wrong? Yeah, oh. yeah, that's right. Woo. It's like you're changing a car on a tire. Boop, 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 a car I knew tire it. I knew with any a. Time uh, I drank beer, I had better yeah, rates. there you go. Now it's coming out. So <laughs> the numbers are <laughs> so, <laughs> there's starting to come out. One here. thing about that though is if this, if you put the point weight forward, yeah, fulcrum moves up. Then less the fulcrum less. is much longer. Yeah, the okay. destabilizing fulcrum is less. The stabilizing fulcrum. Is, so if I stabilizing, it's like a pry bar. So if I put more weight uh, forward, do I have to have bigger fletchings in the back? No. No, smaller. Smaller, smaller. fletchings. Yeah, it's right. a torque it's, arm. It's more efficient. This piece is more efficient physically. Yep. And you can shoot tiny fletches. I shoot one and a half inch long feathers that are half inch tall. So oh. just for fun, well, it wasn't fun when it happened. I lost <laughs> fletchings off of my arrow. So I was essentially shooting bear shafts just for fun. I had like six bear shaft arrows and I was like, eh, let's see how they shoot, you know? I didn't notice any difference. Like at 40 yards. They shot fine. Yeah, they shot fine. Then your bows, your bows in your tune, bows your arrows in tune, and arrows in tune. I think, and I thought that they were, and I assumed that that was now the shoot case, them through paper at, at forty yards. Well, we, I think right, that's probably something that we're going to do here, right? Yeah. Do paper tune for the bear shaft. Well, yeah. I mean, knock tuning out of the gate and bear shaft tuning seems like a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Why are Why are we not doing that? Well, and it, it is funny because, um, in, in fact, I think it was target archery guys who were the ones who were like, "Yeah, I shoot four inch fletchings, not those little two inch pieces of shit or whatever." Well, well I, let's talk about that. We didn't talk. We didn't discuss that. Okay. Um, if you shoot smaller fletching, you can move the fletching back further. Back further on the arrow on itself the arrow, than the shaft. It gives you more torque arm, more lever arm. Okay. Right. Our, ours are back pretty far, and it was not intentional when that happened. It just, mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know what that just, meant. Just be careful they're not on your face. Yeah, I've heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. If the fletch is touching your face. Too far back. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard that as well. So you can actually lower the drag of your arrow by putting smaller fletching if you have a higher FOC. And you can go faster. Interesting. Over distance. Uh, say again? It doesn't drag as much. So uh, say it one more time. Uh, if you do what? If you have a, uh, uh, you're just trying to increase the distance between the center of gravity and where the fletching is. And that does what? That you can lower the drag by putting smaller fletching if you can move it further back. Just and so a lot, of okay. a lot of cases, if you, sh instead of shooting four inch fletching, you go to two inch fletching, you can move it further okay. back. You can pick up the advantage of yeah. uh, longer lever arm. And, and would you say just the further back, the better, as long as it's not touching your face? Yeah. Yeah, all day yeah. long. Okay. okay, so here's where you run into an issue, is how quickly does your arrow roll up the smaller fletching will roll it up slower. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. The high, the longer fletching, you get more lift in the radial lift, direction, yep. and it will roll up faster. They'll still, if their angle is still the same, they'll roll up to the same amount. Mm -hmm. Right? It was one will do it slower than the other. But that's something we no one ever discusses how quickly an arrow rolls up. It's not that big a deal for us, but the stability is a big deal. And that, I didn't finish what I was saying while I go. If we change the FOC of a field point, let's say a 10% field point, and then we take that field point off, a 10% forward FOC, right? You shoot your target, hits a bullseye at 40 yards, great. You can take that field point off and put a big broadhead on there, even a mechanical with exposed blades, and you won't hit anywhere close to that same point. So just because you have the same percent FOC doesn't automatically imply that you have the same stability of your arrow, right? and it, that it will hit at the same point. So if you're not practicing with your, again, if you don't practice with your broadheads, you just assume that because I've got 10, 15% FOC, I'll get the same impact point. Not gonna happen. Not, not, I, I, and the thing that the industry strives to say, these fly like field points. Yeah, 100%. That's, that's what, what you well, hear that's, that's what you want. Wouldn't it be great? That's what guys Everybody want, wants yeah. to be able to yeah. shoot them field points and then yeah. go out and shoot their yeah. broadheads, well, and it, it is the same. Well, what's deceiving is that might be true out to 30 yards, 40 sure. yards. Sure, It's not the same at 60 yards. Well, if you're Troy, it doesn't matter. That's fine. 
That's yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, the national. So this is what I learned from Matt over at VIP. The national average <clears throat> distance. What do you think that is for killing white-tailed deer? I think it's twenty-five under, yards. Yeah, I would yeah. say it's under twenty-five. Yeah, I think it's high. He said it's thirty-eight. Killing or 30 shooting? It? Well, maybe it's shooting right. at. Yeah. Well, and that you 20 know, yards. The, the big thing here that we're talking about, guys, is a dramatic shift in the effectiveness of archery equipment, which honestly will change the entire dynamic of how we manage whitetail deer in this country. I know that sounds like, holy shit, where did that come from? But that's what it is, right? I mean, there is an ineffectiveness happening in killing a whitetail deer because of the way this industry has monetized archery equipment. Yeah. The that's more effective that we absolutely become. True. Right? It's better for the sport all around. It's better for the animal. It's better for the sport. But the what I wonder is how have the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks adapted to inefficiency because we've been doing it for 10-plus years? Well, that's an interesting thing you just brought up. So Texas Parks and Wildlife has actually adopted the 12 factors as something that has required information for all bow hunting instructors. In Texas. <clears throat> In Texas. Right. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's big, awesome. big wow. damn thing. It's amazing, dude. Texas. Well, the guy who runs the whole um, education department bonked an elk. Yep. With a muzzy and a, he's a big, tall guy too. Yeah. He's not shooting. He's not twenty-six inch draw. Shooting right? 30, 31 gen spears. Right. And then mm -hmm. he got a hold of us, and we set him up with six fifty. And the you next two elk saying. had I mean, a really bad day. There, there has like to, not out of sight. There is a certain portion of deer that are being shot and wounded and probably dying, maybe not dying. Like there's an inefficiency that's been brought on. And we beat this industry up a couple of weeks ago in a podcast. So I'm not going to do it again, but it, it's ultimately created problems to where we can fix them with the right information and, and be a better sport. And frankly, maybe be a little less uh, shitty to the public of like, well, yeah, I saw this deer walking around in whatever central park new york with an arrow sticking out of its ass or, the thing yeah. that the, the the other step aside of that is a, a deer arrow is not an elk arrow yeah agreed agree and so i mean you're talking about an animal is three times the size of yet sometimes bone people structure, mistake just them basic things <laughs> as the bone same. structure yes. meat on the side thickness of the chest wall stupid physiology is just facts yeah. Yep. And guys say, man, this thing works on deer. I shoot 400 grains, works all the time. And then they go elk hunting. Yep. And you're just shooting a whole lot more dense target with a ton of drag. Yep. A shoulder shot on an elk, which a big shoulder, so that's a big V. Yep. We're talking about a hole that big in the vital V on an elk that where I say to shoot stuff, straight up the leg, lower one third. Yep. You may be pushing through five or six inches of shoulder meat yep. before you hit the rib cage inch and a half there and then it's got to continue another double it 12 see. or 14 inches yeah. to hit the other thoracic wall we're talking about 20 24 inches of penetration and, and that, that's a big enough animal that dude i would i'd consider changing my setup for elk mm. not so drastically maybe to go all the way to where you're at but, but i would consider shooting like a, a two blade fixed blade broadhead you know yeah. 50 yards and in with yeah. my current setup for, mm -hmm. for an elk i think that'd be the change that i would consider yeah right, right. I, I, I just that it scares me because most people a 243 is a perfectly adequate whitetail deer rifle. Yeah, but you're not going to shoot an elk with that. You can kill an elk with it, but most people buy a 300. It's but nice that seems like very common knowledge, yeah, I mean, that's Troy. Right. Everybody right. needs guns. Like people know that though. They're like, oh yeah, I'm not going to shoot my 243 for elk. I'm going to take an <laughs> six or a 308 or whatever. Why is it not common knowledge at this level? But it's just we'll get there. We're working on it, right? Yeah, the the it, biggest challenge I've seen out west is the distance. Yeah. Most of us are hunting kind of stand situations with the 243 yeah, and a deer comes out in the Dakotas yards, doing you got him, right? Yeah. But in out west, if you just zero at 300. Yeah. If you're not zero to 300 and you're going out west, you're kind of losing it cuz you're shooting across canyons. It's not Well, and Jared, when we when Jared and I say we shoot <laughs> 60, 70, 80, it's because we go to the Dakotas and hunt mule deer, spot and stock on the ground. When we're hunting whitetails, we're not shooting 60, 70, well, 80 yards. In, in fairness, we were fully prepared for 60, 70, 80. You and I both shot it. Less than 20. In terms of, yeah. <laughs> With yes. your broadheads or just your field points? Uh, what? Pr practice? Practice, yeah. Field I points. I was field points. Yeah, yeah. field points. Yeah. So who knows what it was. So let's do the Rocket Man challenge. You come back and we'll see if that changes right. your mind on how you're going to set up and practice for those kinds of shots. Okay. I think it will. I think it will. When you change, when you change even if you put your mechanicals up front, I think it will change your impact dispersion enough that it will open your eyes and say, I don't want to do that. 
Well, listen, or you change your pins for broadheads. You change your pins for broadheads, yeah. but that doesn't change right. the dispersion pattern. Yeah, right. It'll right. change how much it drops, yeah. but your dispersion pattern may be larger. I'd be fully prepared to say that that would be larger. Right on. Broadheads. All right, so we're going to do a Rocket Man Challenge. What is, for anyone listening, what's the best place to find information? Ranch Ferry? Is yeah, that you where can go to my YouTube channel through? at the Ranch Ferry. It's kind of a big deal. You can just type into Google. I I stumbled on the name. So where did that come from, by the way? What? Uh, we have a ranch in South Texas, and I am the manager. And so my wife's the, family has not. My who's wife, the ferry? The ferry's me. Okay. Oh yeah. And uh, obviously, right? <laughs> Look at me. I mean, I have a little baby. I thought it was shirt. Surprised, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so, um, about 15 years ago, I took over the ranch and started doing all the fix this, fix that, keep the house going, AC work. I, it just it's good for my brain. Mm-hmm. And um, I started calling myself the Ranch Ferry. And people would be like, where's the big bucks? You've seen the cameras lately? Da, da, da. da. Can you make me dinner reservations? And, and God help, the AC's got to be working. We're not going. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, it's not working. Okay. So when I started my channel, on Google, you're either, you get a lot of hits. Yep. Or you're super unique. Yep. And I said, hmm. And I went to GoDaddy and I typed it in there. And they said, ranchferry.com is available. And I said, oh, wow. Bought that. Typed it into Google and nothing came up, like Fairy Ranch for some horses or something. Mm-hmm. And I went, "That's a freaking winner!" Yeah, super. Unique. Totally, Fairy's not the tough guy. Freaking mm-hmm. Yeah, tattooed up, flat brim. Yeah, yeah I don't business. know if I told. Did I tell you this that I did not contact you for about eighteen months because you had Fairy on the end of your name? And I know I was that. Like, I was that's a little why bit a lot of people. <laughs> that's why a lot of that's people. That's why we haven't to talked to him till now. But yeah, well, right. Lord, you said you know, they, and you're hey, if you have problems with arrows, give me a call. And I'm like, I'm not going down there. Yeah, right. The that ranch was some. Yeah, you lose some Fairy. Woo! Yeah, making some money on the side. Hey, twenty bucks is twenty bucks. <laughs> what happens on the ranch stays on the ranch. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, Come to the ranch, baby. <laughs> so it just took off from there, and it's a, just a unique enough name and brand that nobody forgets it. That's awesome. Yeah, and man. so it really has been fun. I like I said, I did not expect this to happen. Well, I, congrats, dude. I mean, yeah. it's it's a cool thing, and you know, um, you know, it's funny when we talked earlier. You know, you're like, yeah, kind of like don't belong in this thing. You do, you know. And frankly, per this discussion. I think it's more needed than several of the people or a lot of people in this building. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. You know, and uh, thank you for being on this thing because really for you and Daryl to be on here and enlighten us. I mean, you can see we're, we're like, we truly, the reason this podcast has been put together is because like we want to learn this stuff. Like, right. And, and we don't have loyalties and we're not, you know, over proud of what our setups are. We just want to be better hunters and more efficient hunters. And like, we truly are curious about this stuff. And so, yeah. So yeah. it's super helpful. Yeah. It's fun to do the education piece and have a cool debate and just discuss yeah, what you're doing. And well, we like along. to learn, so it's well, easy, we're gonna it's do easy for us to sit here and get educated. We're doing the Rocket Man Challenge, so that'll be awesome, and, yeah. and hopefully it'll it'll bring some data. Yeah, and, post that on yeah. your channel and stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, in do. fact, we'll it do. debuted here. We've been talking about hey! it back and forth for like three months. How about that? You guys, right. You guys are well, going to be the ones to bring it when out. When this is all, when you're done and you've kind of got something to talk about, let's reconvene and, and go back over it, you know, on on the podcast. Yeah, we'll do a podcast of the Rocket Man Challenge. I'll do I it too. It. I'm gonna, I got, I'm going to try it because I got to figure out for Nil Guy, how far am I really going to shoot? Yeah, man. Because I'm going to be pretty jacked. Nil Guy's a very unique animal. I know. They're only in Texas, and I've wanted to kill one for a long time. And you I got going this, by like Kingsville or something? Yeah, we're going down yep. down south of Kingsville. Cool. And uh, I really, I, I'm amped up with that. That's awesome. I mean, man. deer are fine, but those things are. That'd be cool. Oh, there's not, I don't know a lot of people who have them. No. The guys I know who have them have 10. Yeah. Because they got addicted to shooting them yep. and started going. Yeah. And whacked the hell out of them. That's awesome. But I just don't know a lot of people who have them. I went to Africa and I have a kudu and a bless buck and a black wildebeest and all that stuff. And and it would it's not going to be the same as an ill guy. It's just not. It, uh, Africa is cool, but I don't <laughs> it's know. Texas, Texas is Texas. Yeah. Well, listen, boys, we appreciate you coming on Hunter Podcast and joining mm-hmm. us here at the uh, ATA show. Uh, look forward to being part of the Rocket Man Challenge. And Rocket Man Challenge. I love that. Yeah. And then let's let's circle back up when we got some results. I'm sure the listeners are really going to appreciate this. This is the first conversation we've had on the podcast. We're 50 plus deep into this on something like this. Awesome. Um, and I think it's really, uh, I'm sure we're going to get a ton of feedback on if it. If y'all get a lot of questions, which you probably will, mm-hmm. start to kind of figure out where the middle is. Yep. And we'll just do it again in a few months. Perfect. And talk about what cool. comes in. Love it, man. When I first did the first podcast I ever did with a hunting public, they literally didn't publish it. Zach Farrenball was like this. Yeah. His, he was freaking out. Smoke at just all pulling this stuff, out his ear. Right? Yeah. You can, 
arrow tuning. Oh my god! Yeah. And I, I was like, so I called him like two months later. Said, "Hey man, you haven't put the podcast up." He goes, "We can't put that up. <laughs> People's <laughs> minds will melt." <laughs> well, our email, and I started laughing, and I was like, "Okay, okay bro." And we did another one. It's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the first one. Just exploded. They, I mean, literally, well, that was Zach a couple was years just, ago, right? When it was first, like in those Full Metal Jacket days, when people oh, were yeah. first like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I get FOC, it. wait, right." Yeah. And then we did one here, and that's when he's it probably really right. Our brains would have exploded at that time. This is good, though. This is really good. Well, we appreciate it, guys. Yeah, Thanks thank for you. coming on. Enjoy Welcome back anytime. Trip, yeah. And yeah, we'll have you all back on Hunter pa- Podcast. And for everyone else listening, thanks for listening to what is this, Colty? Fifty four. Yes, something like that. Fifty five. 55. Wow. 55. All right. Michael. Episode 55 of the Hunter Podcast. So, Troy, Daryl, much appreciated, boys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. See you guys later. Sing me.